Oh, we're streaming. Are we streaming? Am I live? Can you hear my silky smooth can you hear my voice? It sounds like you can. It sounds like you can. And uh, we're just going to go for it. Uh, let's make some announcements. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. At notice? Hey, look, I already typed it. That way I don't forget it. <laughs> okay. Uh, oop, it's not. <laughs> don't worry about me. I'll be fine. We are live. I think I do a red circle, too. And then we're going to do OS development. Hey. Fog. <laughs> Hey, it's the correct link. I was worried. Okay. Yeah. In case the uh, the title didn't spoil you, that announcement just did. Welcome to the first OS stream. Who knows how it's going to go? It may be horrible. We will see. Uh, we're going to completely build... Hey, Serraid, what's up? We're going to completely build Lenser OS uh, from scratch. So we're just going to git clone it. And then we're going to go from there and follow all the steps. And uh, you can see exactly how to build Lenser OS. Sorade says, apparently, I joined 100 seconds into the stream. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. It's been a minute 40 now. <laughs> Sorade says minus 100, not 100. Oh, oh, I read it wrong. You're right. Hey, Ruark, my favorite Twitch stream is live, FogChamp. Hey, FogChamp to you. What's up, Ruark? How's it going? Thank you for tuning in. Serade, you as well. Thank you for tuning in. So uh, let's just get it going. We're doing a streamer, and we're just doing a Git clone. Uh, there are many ways to do this. I could just run a shell command, Git clone. I'm going to use maggot clone, which is just a, an Emacs plugin which runs git clone for me. But uh, you can see it just asks, it, I almost said it asks. It asks us for a URL path, local URL or bundle. This is a URL. Here's the URL. We're gonna put in, uh, what is it? <laughs> colon slash slash github.com. Uh, we'll do codeberg dot org slash Lens plays games slash lenser OS dot git. I'm pretty sure that's correct. Sarade says, did you see my pull request? Oh no, I did not. <laughs> did you make it on uh, Codeberg or GitHub? Probably GitHub. Oh, it's probably on Codeberg. Sarade says on Codeberg. You're a legend, Sarade. Thank you. So if you don't know, uh, development of the OS is currently happening mostly on Codeberg, which is a, uh, a little not-for-profit or non-profit based in Germany, I believe. And they are basically hosting their own Gitty instance. And as long as your projects are free and open source, then you are completely cool to use it. So that's what I'm doing. I do have a uh, new pull request. Make scripts executable. Nice. Nice. That's good. So on Windows, I write the shell scripts for Linux <laughs> and then use WSL to run them. This makes them executable with the Linux command that I can't really run on Windows. It doesn't... I don't have permission from WSL to alter the execution uh, flags. Ruark says, I think it's in Berlin, actually, so where I live. Maybe I should visit them. That's awesome. Maybe you should. That'd be sweet. You can make them executable in WSL, as far as I know. Can you really? I couldn't figure it out. It said permission denied all the time. And then I looked it up, and they said you can't uh, alter, like, Windows files. I think the shell files themselves would have to be in the WSL file system, not in the mount, the Windows mount which is where everything is now. But you're probably right. You're probably right. I can probably do it. I'm just not good enough. Uh, I don't know how. Uh, make scripts executable. 
it, I'm pretty sure it's fine. All of them have zero changes. They're just executable now. Um, that's perfect. We're just gonna merge this bad boy. Uh, what's the last commit? Let me make sure. Yeah, hopefully fix stuff. So we're good. So I'm just gonna rebase and fast forward. This is what I wanna do, right? This will just add this commit. I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure. I'm gonna set a due date for you. This has to be done. <laughs> That's so funny. Add dependencies, what does that even mean? Is that like issues? Oh, if you can add issues, oh, that's cool. I don't know what all these are, but this is cool. <laughs> what are all these? <laughs> My toot to raise awareness on the get to open letter. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I don't know why this makes me laugh so hard. It's so dumb. I don't know what all this stuff is, but uh, oh no, oh no, 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 no. <laughs> oh, I'm dying. Oh no, let's cancel. <laughs> Nothing, please. I'm just gonna select my toot. I don't know what else. Well, I can't change it back. <laughs> oh man. Don't click that button. <laughs> it just straight says rip. We're just gonna rebase and fast forward. Hopefully nothing broke. <laughs> Guess we gotta wait for that open letter now. <laughs> I'm pressing escape, delete. Backspace. Nothing works, man. I can <laughs> We gotta pick something. <laughs> first time chat from Edible Monad. You can't merge it now. Resolve the toot issue first. <laughs> oh, why is this? I don't even know what these are. <laughs> Your project will forever have my toot to raise as a dependent. <laughs> Sir, it's a brilliant UI, almost as intuitive as GitHub not letting you access comments from the commits page. <laughs> oh, by the way, thank you so much for tuning in, Edible Monad. You have a great name. You like Haskell? I'm gonna just refresh the page. Yes, changes may not be saved. Thank God. <laughs> we're good. We're good. We're toot free and we're gonna keep it that way. <laughs> oh. Ruark asks the eternal question. I'm learning Haskell right now. What's a monad? <laughs> oh no. Oh, I feel so bad for you. Rourke says tooth free. I like that. <laughs> this this OS needs to be toot free. <laughs> it's so ridiculous. <laughs> Sirade says a monad is a monoid in the category of endofunctors. Duh. <laughs> He's right. Uh, edible monad says monad is the monoid in the category of in hunger. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was, that was a good day today. Edible Monad, thank you so much for the follow. <laughs> Luckily, we're toot free. You don't have to eat any any toot monads. We we we've we've, <laughs> we've smitten it out of this out of this OS. <laughs> we're gonna just do it. <laughs> I'm laughing too hard. Oh God. We are merged. Welcome, Sir Aid, as a contributor to Lenser OS. I think you're the you're the third now. Okay. Clone two, yeah, Lenser OS. Uh, sure. So <laughs> now that we clone this, Edible Monad says this PR was a roller coaster. <laughs> It was rough, man. 
it was a uh, oh man like that keemstar intro the other day <laughs> almost died okay so now we have our uh lenser os that's good it's here and uh here's the directory this is what you get and we're gonna take a look at the readme and we're going all the way to building building lenser os yes there's a ton of stuff to do i already have all the dependencies that i do need so we are good to go. <laughs> oh man. Roark says toot toot. I like trains. <laughs> Sorry, it says welcome to Haskell. <laughs> so good. Okay, so there's effectively four steps. One of them is downloading dependencies, which we've done. So there's three steps. <laughs> We got to build the bootloader, and if you don't know, the bootloader is basically the thing that uh, your system boots into. So, like for example, Grub, GNU Grub, that's a very common one for Linux, and uh, on Windows, it's obviously Windows specific, and on Lenser OS, it's Lenser OS specific. It's a UEFI based bootloader, 64 bit. So we just uh, boot right into long mode, which is pretty sweet. We don't have to do any uh, build the 16-bit page tables, switch to 32-bit protect mode, build the 32-bit page tables, switch to 64-bit long mode, build the 64-bit page tables, then we can start. We just get to start at the 64-bit, which is lucky, which is lucky, which is lucky. Thank you, UEFI. So if we take a look at the bootloader instructions, uh, it's going to change, blah, blah, blah. I made my own bootloader. We're going to use it eventually. You can check it out on GitHub. In any case, in any case, the bootloader is an EFI application which runs in the UFI shell, which is basically what replaced BIOS at some point. So what comes on your motherboard will be able to run this bootloader. And then we basically have to use PE32 plus executables with the proper subsystem for an EFI application. All of this is handled by a make file. Uh, so yeah, now we just have to build the bootloader with make. It's not too complicated. I think I'm going to use eShell for this stuff. I should have opened a new window first. But uh, you can see I have my shell open on the right side now. And what we can do is just literally run what's over here on the left right here. Sorry, it says, I'd recommend make-j instead. Nah, you'll see. It's quick. Uh, and now that we're in here, I'm on Windows, so I'm going to use WSL. And just, you can pipe any command into WSL from the shell just by running it, uh, passing it as argument. So now we can just use WSL make. Sorry, it says, that's true. The bootloader doesn't take long to compile. I'm pretty sure it would take longer to set up all the threads. We've done it. So uh, we now have it. That only ever has to be done once. From here, we can actually build the bootloader executable by typing make bootloader. Look at me forgetting WSL, by the way. Is there a way to, oh yeah, I gotta use that. Okay, I can't hit uh, home. I gotta hit control A. Usually I hit home with my right hand. Don't at me. <laughs> So it says, now nah, setting up threads is faster than that. You could be right. You could be right. Uh, so yeah, now we just make the bootloader. So it says, if it's not, you have a bad OS. <laughs> Lamal, that was the bootloader, by the way. It's very simple. One file. So all we have to do... By the way, if you're curious, this is just regular GCC on Linux. They pass in some uh, specialties, but it's really not that different. You know what I mean? And then uh, you just object copy, and you basically just rearrange the entire file right here. It's pretty funny. But yeah, you can just do this by hand if you really want. If you are confused at what all this make make bootloader stuff is, if you're interested, it's not too complicated. You can definitely do it by hand. It's just not uh, pleasant to write commands like this, as you probably know. Rourke says, that was quick, lol. <laughs> 
Yep, that was the bootloader. So now we can see, oh man, uh, now we can see that we have, I think, ls bootloader. Nope, that's just uh, the source files. It's ls x86 64 bootloader. And now we have main.efi. So if we do a, uh, a little file test on that, you can see that it's a PE32 plus executable, an EFI application for x86-64 with a stripped of debug info for Microsoft Windows. That's just because it's PE32 plus, but this is exactly what we need. Sir Aid says, my internet connection sucks, so I'm gonna benchmark how long it takes just to compile GCC. Oh, that's really cool, I'm very interested. It's, it's going to take us two hours. I'm not even joking. We're going to be sitting here for two hours very soon. Because <laughs> if you don't know, the next step, hint, hint, is... Uh, is it clear? The next step, hint, hint, is uh, a little rough. Now we have to build the tool chain and the kernel. The tool chain is a special version of the GNU com compiler collection. This is needed because it needs to know where to look for things like libraries, like system libraries and system headers. And it basically has to know what your libc is and how it works. And uh, if you don't know, I wrote the Lenser OS has its own libc. So you also are going to have to build that <laughs> if you really want. King Bun says, I'm excited. Hey, King Buns, what's going on? I'm so glad you're here. Thank you for tuning in. I'm glad you're excited. I'm excited. <laughs> this takes a long time, and it takes like five gigabytes of hard drive space or more. It's like seven these days. So this this is the 15 to 90 minutes uh, step. You know what I mean? So if you can, really, if you can, use a pre-built Lenser OS tool chain. I really recommend it. They're not going to be up to date but you don't have to wait a long ass time. If you do want to wait a long time and you're okay with it, here's all the things you're going to need. I already did this. So uh, on Windows, you need to do this in WSL and on Linux, you just run this command or on Debian, I should say. Anyways, then you just run toolchain.sh and while toolchain.sh is running, we're going to be talking about what it's doing. Y'all ready? <laughs> so, oh, yeah, CD toolchain. So, you can see that we have here. Let's open this. Can I do this? This is a good idea. One second. I'm setting something up. This will look better. Uh, yeah. King Bun says, I started it. Oh, onwards, trust stead, Lamau. So, can I make this bigger? I can. Look at that. Look at that. How beautiful. Perfect. So you can see that this is now our thing. And if we look in the toolchain directory, you can see that there's some stuff, mostly toolchain.sh. And... Uh, what we're going to do is run that. Oh, it does a lot. I recommend looking at what it does before you run it. Serade says, it prompts me for a file to patch when I run the patch command by hand. Are you... Uh, hmm. King Bun says, no, always run shell scripts without looking. Ruark says, it's too big. That's better. Nice. King Bun says, trust Steed. That was rough. Trusty. <laughs> nice. Onwards, trusty Steed. That makes more sense. I like onwards, trust Stead is <laughs> much better. Serade says, never mind. I think I was in the wrong directory. Yeah, you have to run this from the toolchain directory or things will break. Serade says, yeah, it works now. King Buns, you may be in the wrong directory. Are you in the toolchain directory? He says he pasted a make error. I've seen that before. King Bun says I am. I don't know. We'll see if we get it. <laughs> Woo! So we're going to first download GNU bin utils. This includes things like uh, TAR, the archiving program, and 
It may just include R, not TAR, but don't worry about it. But it includes, most importantly, LD, the GNU linker. So we've downloaded it. That wasn't too bad, luckily. My internet's uh, obliging. King Buns, we will... Uh, I've ran into that issue before. I'm pretty sure it was just... Uh, the wrong directory, but I'm sure it, there's multiple causes for it. So I will think about it. And if we run into it, I will really think about it. <laughs> you can always do everything by hand if you really want. We download GNU Ben Utils and GCC source code. Again, this, uh, this tutorial that's written out is older. We're using GCC 12.1.0 now. And basically, Extract the archives to get the source code. Yes. You uh, use tar. Extract the exit files that you downloaded, which is all the source code for Benutils and GCC. We patch them, which is a way to uh, update the, the code with certain changes. And this allows GCC to actually recognize Lenser OS is the OS that it's running on. And it can uh, look in the proper places for libc headers and libc libraries and etc. And also have all the proper configuration. You also have to create a sys root. This hasn't happened yet. We're still extracting bin utils, which is going to take forever. Uh, extracting GCC is going to take even longer because it's like 100,000 files, maybe 300,000. I, I don't even know at this point. No rule to make target all GCC. Stop make. No rule to make target all target libgc. So if we take a look at the toolchain script, you can see that basically what it does is says download, if this uh, doesn't exist already, download, extract, and patch source archives if they haven't been, which is uh, what these sections do here. King Bun says, is wrong window? What? LS, wrong window? I'm confused. So now we've extracted and patched bin utils. That's good. King Bun says, I typed. <laughs> King Bun says, oh, I typed LS in Twitch chat, Lamau. Oh, you <laughs> I get it now, wrong window. <laughs> that's, so, that's so good. That's so good. So now we're downloading the uh, GNU compiler collection source archive. We are right here using curl. <coughs> and uh, eventually we will get to creating a sys root, which we have a whole nother script for. As you can see, it's quite complicated. It has to do with the libc headers because you have to compile GCC with all of the libc headers that it's going to be using. And they have to be like in the proper hierarchy that they will be on the destination OS that it will run on. So in Lenser OS, the sys root basically is a mimicked copy of the Lenser OS root file system. And this is needed so that we can compile uh, GCC with the proper sys root, <coughs> and it will look in the proper places for system headers and everything like that. I love that you typed ls in Twitch chat. That's pretty legendary. <laughs> Why aren't my directory showing? What's going on? <laughs> but yeah. Oh, this is going to take probably 10 minutes. Uh, so, while we extract it, let's talk about it. What we're going to do next is do something called configuring and then building. If you don't know, auto configure is like this whole ecosystem of tools. And they basically have scripts that you can run with certain parameters, and it'll alter how the final build process uh, happens. For example, we can disable w error which means that even if we're compiling with w error, which is forced in some places, we can actually disable it in this configure script. And even though we compile with w error, it won't error out on a warning. 
which means that your 30 plus minute compilation won't stop because of a warning, which is a big deal, right? King Bun says it CDs into GCC's 12.1.0 build in the bash script, but aren't the make files in GCC without the build? No, the make files are generated by the configure. This is correct, I promise. I'm pretty sure Serade said it works. He may have done it by hand, but I'm pretty sure he said uh, toolchain.sh worked for him. That doesn't mean it works for you. I'm not saying it's your fault. So it says it works on my end. So we got Windows confirmed and Linux confirmed because I built it yesterday. So it says both toolchain.sh and by hand works. Legendary. So let's try and help King Buns. What do we, uh, what do we think is going on? It, no rule to make target. How could that happen in make? How could that happen in make? So you're down here. You've already configured but the configure script didn't make the proper targets. Maybe a GCC string may have been set wrong. I, I don't even know. I'm trying to figure it out. So it's going to take a while. So let me look up. Let's just bring up this. And uh, yeah, we can do this one sec. Yeah, in my GCC build directory, there's only a config.log. Yeah, that would be the issue then. So the configure didn't run. Probably didn't sudo the bash script. Uh, yeah, it shouldn't need it shouldn't need sudo, but you can try uh, at your own risk. I wouldn't. No, I don't think it needs it, unless uh, Serade has something to. Yeah, Serade says you don't need to sudo it. That's what I was thinking as well. Uh, so let's see, make. No rule to make target stop. So why would configure not be run? Sarade says, I'm building GCC right now, so the instructions are working. All right, that's good. That's good. Uh, King Buns, can I recommend something? Just try and run this configure manually. Maybe toolchain dir, like maybe pwd or dir name is different on your system and it didn't work uh, how it's expected which is fine, it's kind of expected. But, uh, so maybe this toolchain dir replacement didn't go well, and this GCC string may have not gone well as well. So try and run the configure script by hand. So what that would look like is you could go into the, uh, into the Lenser OS toolchain, and then you said you already have the GCC build, so you can just CD into the GCC dash build, right? Wherever that is. And then once you're in there, you can do dot dot slash 12.1.0 slash configure with all the options. <laughs> so it says, except that I changed the GCC version from 11.2 to 12.1 in the hand instructions. Nice. Yeah, that's just because I haven't rewritten them. I could honestly just do a search and replace. But yeah, you should be able to configure by hand. Really make sure to get all of these arguments. They're all very important. And uh, you may have to set target and prefix and figure out what they are. It's not gonna be the easiest. I, <laughs> I'm sorry, <laughs> but it's definitely doable. And you could run the configure script by hand like that and then see if that works or if the configure script is spitting out errors that aren't being shown by toolchain.sh. Sarade says, you didn't escape the path, shame on you. Oh no. And by you, I mean lens that always surround, always surround shell expansion with double quotes. Otherwise it'll break if path contains spaces. That could be King Buns' issue then. That could definitely be King Buns' issue. Because I didn't do that anywhere. <laughs> I don't, uh, so I just copied verbatim the, the scripts from OS Dev the little bits, and then I made them into this larger script. Like I collected this from one page, this from another. I actually wrote that myself, all the downloading and extracting stuff. But this stuff where you configure and make bin utils and GCC, I just copied it. I don't trust. <laughs> King Bun says my paths most definitely never have spaces. Oof. Okay, so it's not that. So it says, so you should really do 
something like this. Yeah, probably. <laughs> so it says time for another PR then. I'm pretty sure my shell script linter will scream at me when I open this file. <laughs> probably. By the way, it's completely normal to have this take a long time. It's a, it's a lot of files, in case you didn't know. Like, if we look at it so far, it's already 76,000 files and 4,600 folders, and there's more. So, like I said, it's a large extraction. It takes a while. Sarade says you can do tar xvf to see a progress report. That way you know it's actually doing something. That slows it down tremendously. Because all of the files it's extracting are tiny. They're like a kilobyte. They're all the test cases and shit like that from GNU. So the thing is, by printing out or taking the time to print out each of the file names, it takes longer. So it says extracting took five seconds on my system with XVF. Good for you. <laughs> Good for you. I'm jelly. I, I won't I won't lie. So it says, I always do XVF, and I don't think it's that bad, to be honest. When extractions on your system take this long, it's that bad. It's a big difference. It used to be like 45 minutes. That's also when I'm SSH'd into a server. Oh, Christ. Again, 10-year-old hardware. <laughs> Gotta go easy on me, boy. King Bun says, what flags does that enable? Um, extract verbose, and here's the file that you're about to, uh, here's like the archive file that you should extract. That's what dash F. I think dash X actually puts it in exit mode, not extract. So the, the dot tar dot X Z. Alrighty, we are, uh, we are halfway through, I'd say. <laughs> the extraction of GCC. We're running the shell script on the left that I wrote. Takes a long time, but uh, it's much easier than running things by hand. If we were doing things by hand, we would be right at about this step. You can also find this stuff on Codeberg or GitHub. All these files are up there. This is the readme.md and the toolchain subdirectory of Linzer OS. Sir Aid says, I'm pretty sure dash X is extract, but I could be wrong. We're programmers. We figure it out. Uh, Dash X. Dash X. <laughs> uh, <laughs> there's no dash X. Oh, here it is. Dash X. Extract. We did it. You are correct. Yep. Extract, update, list, add, replace, create. I don't think I've ever used anything other than C and X. What do these do? <laughs> what is add, replace, and how is it different from update? <laughs> Why are there hashes? Hmm. Suspicion. Yeah, here's here's what I was remembering. It's dash Z. That's the one. Dash J for XC. Is that really true? Amazing. There you go. And that's tar. So it says, I always do CXVF and ZXVF for tar.gz files. Nice. CZVF. Nice. Both C and X at the same time doesn't make sense, lol. I was wondering. So create and extract. <laughs> yes. Oh, man. Alrighty. But yeah, this is doing a large thing. We are basically extracting all of the... Hey! <laughs> we did it! Hey, that was perfect timing. We've extracted. We're done extracting. We are now downloading GNU Compiler Collection prerequisites. How about that? Libgomp? Libmpfer? Libmpka? Libmpka? Is that libmpc or is it libmpka? I kind of like libmpka. It's not really a, a, a usual sim, uh, syllable. But mpfer is definitely one of my favorites. Libgomp always just makes me think of <laughs> Super Mario 64. All the, uh, bomb -omb. 
Hey, so now we've patched GCC. Now we're bootstrapping the system root. Now we're configuring GNU bin utils. So we just uh, blasted through a couple of these steps and we are now building and installing GNU bin utils. So again, GNU bin utils contains things like R, the archiving program, uh, LD, the GNU linker, things like this. Also, I really have to fix how all these are written. This is horrible. Uh, I should just write them in LaTeX, provide PDFs. <laughs> So Raid says, all right, I'm done. Rip. Yeah, I'll see you in four hours when I'm done. <laughs> King Bun says, checking target system type, invalid configuration, x86 underscore 64 dash lenser, OS lenser not recognized. Running manual config, I get that. That means the patch wasn't applied to your GCC. You have to patch your GCC then. Because to recognize lenser as a target, you have to patch the source code. I'm so sorry, King Buns. I wish it was <laughs> easier for everybody. But something as complex as an OS is just inherently going to be rough. RPWH says, yeehaw! What's up, RPWH? How's it going? Thank you so much for tuning in. Sorry, it says, stats are in general. Hopefully Discord still works. My CPU is beginning to burn. We haven't... Okay. We've dropped frames. <laughs> Panic. <laughs> okay, we're fine. We only dropped 700 frames. We're good. We're good, fam. King Bun says, yeah, no worries. That makes sense. But I'm so sorry. But it seems like the patch was not applied. So if you run patch with all the the files, that should work. And make sure you, you switch it to 12.1.0. Because 11.2.0... King Bun says, I'm learning a lot. I'm running the patch now. Nice. And make sure to switch everything to 12.1.0. The 11.2.0 patch may not work. It's been literally like a year since I've tried it. <laughs> we switched to 12.1.0 right when it came out in, uh, what was it, July? Oh no, negative 60, Lamau. Yes, <laughs> You're the, the first one here. <laughs> Build stats, extracting bin utils in GCC, five seconds. Bruh, <laughs> that took me 10 minutes. Configuring bin utils, one second. Pretty much. You you didn't include the sys root. Building bin utils, because it's probably a millisecond. Building bin utils, 21 seconds. That's where we are right now. Are we building GCC? I think we're right at the end of bin utils in the background now. Yeah, cr.o. So we're, we're doing a bunch of compilations. Okay, now a bunch of... Compilation and linking, object copy, hey, strip new, hey, elf edit, hey, address to line, ran lib, strings, oh, I just closed. Don't shake too hard. Pretty good. So that's all happening in the background. This took three minutes for Sir Raid, and it's been, it's been, it's been a while. It's been, I'm pretty sure, like 20 minutes for us. King Bun says, reversed or previously applied patch dissected, assume dash R, no. What do I enter here, Lamau? I would enter no, so that means maybe the patch was applied. You'd have to either re-extract GCC, or you'd have to reapply the patch. Make sure it's, again, 12.1.0 and not 11.2.0. The 11.2.0 uh, patches may have been nuked in a commit on accident, thanks to Emacs before save hook, untabifying things which I fixed last yesterday in 12.1.0, but I didn't go back through the old, the old patches. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I wish I could help more. But I, I also have had that uh, exact error message happen all the time during development. But it basically just means that it's trying to apply the patch and it's going, hey, the, the changes that we're going to make are already there. Did you mean to make these changes to the other file instead? Is it reverse? Do you want to apply the patch to the source instead of the output? Okay, we're dropping more frames. We are now building GCC. Or maybe configuring it. Either way, my I can hear my computer ramping up like a jet engine. The system I used to build it. Oh my. Yeah, I don't I don't have I don't have this. <laughs> oh. <laughs> 
this just hurts my soul. I just, I... <laughs> King Bun says, apply anyway? No, yes, two out of two hunks failed, saving rejects. So that looks exactly like the the problems I was getting yesterday. And it was, it had to do with tabs and spaces. I'm so sorry. But th that exact error message would only happen... Oh my. <laughs> that exact error message would only happen when uh, the patch was already applied. Or if the patch has an invalid path. So if like GCC 12.1.0, if it's trying to patch from a file that doesn't exist, it'll go, hey, I don't know what to do, man. Oh no. <laughs> Encoding overloaded. <laughs> Can you still hear me, chat? <laughs> Ground control to Major Tom. Are you there? <laughs> oh no. <laughs> Sorry, it says we can still hear you. <laughs> oh, good, 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 good. Yeah, this is, uh, it's beginning. <laughs> this is what building a very large GNU project looks like, by the way. It's endless checking for this, checking for this, checking for this, checking for this. Sraid says, building LLVM is way worse than this, by the way. I know, <laughs> I can't do it on my system. It's physically impossible. I don't have enough RAM. Sraid says, it takes like 20 minutes on my system. That's it. LLVM is seven times slower than GCC confirmed. Because <laughs> it took three minutes, right? Hey, feel free to move on to the next step if you have the tool chain built. If your uh, computer's faster than, than I. I'm scared to use Emacs at this point. I don't really want to mess with anything. Because I keep getting encoding overloaded messages. And... Uh, <laughs> I haven't dropped frames yet, but it keeps saying encoding overloaded. We're doing good. Sarayd says building took 2 minutes 30 seconds. Oh my god. <laughs> I'm pretty sure we've already done <laughs> double that. Checking whether this printf is declared. Config that status. Creating make file. So... The general build of GCC is build everything. <laughs> There's a lot of stuff. By the way, you see all those warnings that just happened? Yeah, it's a killer when those stop the compilation. That's why we disable WR. <laughs> Disabling native language support may be a bad idea if you want like German or Japanese or any other language output, but uh, it makes it about 20 times slower. I'm not joking. I tried it once. I, it never finished. I gave it a day. And then I was like, yeah, no. So Raid says, it also doesn't help that you're running this in Emacs. Emacs is not a particularly fast terminal. King Bun says, e shell mal. That might be slowing it down too. Maybe. From what I've uh, experienced, e shell does lag behind, but it doesn't actually halt the program. It just, it takes forever to read standard out. So you're seeing, like, old output. It's taking a while to print it. But, uh, the actual program, I've never seen slowed down. We could do tests. We should do tests. Because I'm, I've, I've done this for a long time. I've done it both in Windows Terminal and eShell. And I've never noticed a, a margin, like, a difference. But again, that's not benchmarking. That's just me noticing things. And I'm not, I'm not one to, known to notice things. <laughs> uh, it looks like what we just okay so we just built a lib and now we're starting to build another you can tell because it changed from all the the command line commands to checking for blah 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 so we are now configuring another dependency or part of GCC this may be checking for Perl checking for PDF to HTML oh no Checking for package config. Non-installed package config dash i. So it says, if you're using an old compiler, that'd slow it down too, right? So it says, by the way, what compiler are you using now? 
So what compiler you use to compile GCC is, uh, is a big one. So it says, I noticed a huge improvement in build times going from GCC 11 to 12. So, so it says, I use GCC 12 and it worked on Linux. If that works, that's dope. I couldn't get it. To, well, I guess that was like months ago when I tried, it was in July. I tried in July to use GCC 12 on uh, Windows and everything went horrible. It did not work. <laughs> so it says, why wouldn't it? I got a bunch of errors. I don't know. It just, uh, it would not, it complained about, uh, like sysroot stuff. Like the sysroot wasn't working and I couldn't figure it out. I'm passing, I'm passing, I'm passing with sysroot to the configure, but it just would not work. It kept in trying to include windows headers when they weren't in a freestanding. So it says windows problems. Oh yeah. It was windows specific for sure. <laughs> Linux usually has harder to track down problems, but they make more sense. Windows is just like, oh, it's just because it's Windows. Linux is like, well, there's actually this really complicated problem behind it. This was just our solution. I know there's problems, but this is the best we could do. On Windows, it's just like, yeah, that's just, uh, we don't do that. Why? I don't know. <laughs> King Bun says story of his life when replying to Windows problems by Sir Aid. Oh no. Oh no. I'm gone. I'm gone. No, can you hear me? Stream buffering, or is it just me? Uh, can you hear me? Please, I'm so sorry. The stream is dying. <laughs> My CPU is burning alive. That's right, it says back now. Hey, can you hear me? I'm so sorry. It went down to zero. <laughs> we dropped all frames for like 10 seconds. <laughs> this is so bad. <laughs> oh no. Oh, I'm going to take a picture. I got to show this. Anyone ever tried to use like Discord in a browser and attach a picture on mobile? I'm back. I'm so glad. I oh, I'm gone. Okay, 3,400 dropped frames <laughs> and counting. It's going up. Oh no. Okay. <laughs> oh no, it just went red again. Okay, I'm back. So it says you're gone for like 10 seconds. Yeah. <laughs> oh wow. This is so bad. <laughs> I'm just hoping it works. I'm just hoping it works. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> King Bun says frames? Never heard of her. <laughs> okay, we good again. We're back to configuring. Oh no. We... <laughs> oh no. <laughs> oh no my phone died <laughs> it's in my hands and i'm typing on it and it dies i was trying to send you guys a picture of my uh my dropped frames how they just <laughs> it has begun so it says do make dash j pearl dash e print and proc dash print and proc minus one next time to leave a thread for the stream, lol. <laughs> and yeah, I just used Perl in a shell command because I can't think of a simpler way to subtract two numbers. <laughs> That's what I was wondering. <laughs> Can't you use a uh, exec or a test or something? I remember doing that in bash a while ago. <laughs> yeah, that's a better idea. I'll have to alter the, uh, the tool chain. I'll make a stream toolchain.sh <laughs> that leaves some some goddamn threads for the, uh, for the stream. Yeah, it's dying again. Oh no. Okay, I'm back. That, we only dropped a few hundred frames. <laughs> oh, it's gone again. Are you there? It went red. And it's back green. It's back green. We good. We good. Oh, and it's red again. This is like the, the biggest roller coaster of my life. And I'm sure this is going to be the, the least popular stream in existence. <laughs> it's literally just a terminal. <laughs> oh, 
Ugh. I just am laughing at how uninteresting what I'm doing is. I'm staring at a terminal. <laughs> just running a program. But I can't do anything because my computer's dying. So I... <laughs> There's just nothing I can do, man. <laughs> so it says, I think uh, in parentheses, in parentheses, and proc minus one or something like that works in Bash, but I usually use Perl for arithmetic because arithmetic in Bash is awful and easy to get wrong. That's right, it's not arithmetic, it's arithmetic. <laughs> King Bun says, bro, I'm on my way to get some of what you're smoking. I need those giggles in my life. <laughs> uh... Just get really embarrassed. You'll 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 be great at it. This is nervous laughter. This is not laughter of joy. <laughs> oh no. So it says, by the way, I know you like your toolchain.sh script, but how much would it upset you if I made a CMake script for this instead? It literally used to be like that. <laughs> that way we'd have one top level CMake script for everything. Or maybe you want to do that. I don't know. I do not want to do that. Do you, there's a reason why the kernel is in CMake and everything else is separate. But you'd have to test if it works. That's fine. If you make a branch and I can clone it, that's totally cool. That's kind of... So it says, which is simpler for me to do, just saying. Feel free to do it. Make the top-level CMake script if you feel like you understand it. But I warn you... <laughs> It's already very complicated. Just, I'm like, look at the kernel CMake script and you will understand. Like, okay, there's a lot here. <laughs> you know what I mean? There's a, uh, it's, so it says test if it works means you'd have to build GCC again. Oh, I know. I do this all the time. <laughs> That's why I know how long it takes. <laughs> it takes so long. Oh, don't zone out. Emacs, no. Okay, Jesus Christ. Oh no, I'm dropping, um, no, can you still hear me? I'm dropping frames, boys. I'm going, I'm gone. <laughs> oh no, 15 frames. What are we gonna do? <laughs> what am I gonna do? Average time to render frame is 30 milliseconds. <laughs> <laughs> this is diet. This is going so horribly. I love it. <laughs> Sir, it says you're still here. Hey, but yeah, I do this all the time. I have about ten Lenser OSs just on my system right now, and they all work. <laughs> I don't know why, but I just have to make a new one to test it, and then I don't delete it. And then every once in a while, I go back there and I pull and I cl I do everything there. Sir, it says casual. Four hundred and seventy lines of CMake. I've seen worse. <laughs> Can you imagine if that warning we just got made us fail, by the way? Oh, it's going bad again. Oh, no. So many dropped frames. Oh, no. Oh, it's, oh, it's very bad. Oh, it's very bad. You're going to run out, run out of disk space at that rate, Lamau. I literally have hundreds of gigabytes of Lenser OS. It's horrible. <laughs> it's an addiction at this point. Oh, no. 15 FPS. I'm so sorry, boys. <laughs> this is going bad. Frames missed due to rendering lag, 4,000. Skipped frames due to encoding lag, 4,000. <laughs> 8,192 dropped frames. Oh, no. <laughs> That's like over... <laughs> like over a minute, isn't it? Oh no, King Bun says Lenser OS is bigger than my porn folder. <laughs> oh. Sorry, it says, ah, you know you're doing low level stuff if you have to use the dash M flags. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. The dash lowercase M flags are scary, man. The, the documentation on them is horrid. Sorry, it says, other than MArch equals native, that's the common one. Yeah, that's true. People would like to do that and be like, look, I'm I'm optimizing it. It's fancy. It's like, well, yeah, it's faster. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Build a Canadian cross compiler and then and then get back to me. We're doing a Canadian cross right now. I don't think you can hear me right now, 
because everything is red on OBS and it's screaming at me. It's saying, please stop. Uh, but hopefully, you know, hopefully it's going well. Hopefully I'm not just silent. Sorry, it says, also, your kernel CMake script can be as long as you want it to be, Lamau. <laughs> Sorry, it says, I'm just going to do add subdirectory, lol. And we can hear you just fine. All right, that's good, that's good. Everything is red in OBS. It's just everything's red. It's bad. We'll tell you when you disappear again, bless. I appreciate it. I'm going to need it. <laughs> everything's just constantly red now. That's really funny. <laughs> oh my. <laughs> this is so bad. Just everything's red. I've, I, it's so scary. <laughs> this is everything I don't want to see as a streamer. OBS is screaming at me. Encoding overloaded. Consider turning down video settings or using a faster encoding preset. FPS is 20. Average time to render frame is 30 milliseconds. <laughs> Which is... And there's 20,000 dropped frames. <laughs> due to network. There's 10,000 dropped frames due to encoding. And 10,000 skipped frames due to <laughs> rendering. <laughs> this is the worst, mate. This is literally the worst it could go. This is so awesome. I mean, I guess the stream is still going. It's not the worst. So Raid says 30 milliseconds per frame is more like 30 FPS, I think. Average time to render frame, 45 milliseconds. 117 milliseconds. <laughs> it jumps around, 115. 38. 32. <laughs> Plus, the FPS is also stopped by rendering, encoding, and uh, network. King Bun says, bro, streaming from a toaster. Basically, at this point, I should probably have a fan on. It's going bad. <laughs> All right, you ready to see this, boys? <laughs> okay, I'm taking a picture. One sec. Oh no. <laughs> so it says, do you have BTOP on your machine? I always find it funny to just sit there and watch it when I build big projects, lol. I don't. What's BTOP? I'll have to look into that. <laughs> also, Sir Aid, in the Discord, you said, I love my CPU. I love your CPU, too. I wish I could have it. <laughs> I'm pretty sure you can just do sudo apt install BTOP in WSL if you're interested. Y'all get right on that. <laughs> As soon as this uh, compilation finishes, you know? I'm pretty sure if I try to do anything, like I haven't even clicked out of Emacs. I'm scared to do anything. I'm pretty sure it'll break my computer. The CPU is most definitely just at 100% usage. But I don't want to open Task Manager and find out. That's what's classified as fucking around. <laughs> I don't want to find out. I don't want to find out. Ruark says, still compiling, bro. Oh yeah, oh yeah. We're still going. I, I told you it's going to take two hours while we're streaming. I'm not, I, I have an idea of how long these things take. <laughs> so it says, I put a screenshot in general. Okay, I'm going to try. I'm going to alt-tab into Discord. Yoink. Okay, I'm going to switch OBS. Oh boy. Udas. Udas nice. Is that it? <laughs> Do you see how slow this is? <laughs> this is really pretty. That's really nice. I'll have to try this. Ruark says, okay, I'll be lurking for another hour, I guess. Yeah. No, we're, oh, we're almost done. This, okay, we're actually almost done. Here's another uh, screenshot. Very nice. Should try this out.
This is really cool. Is it going to like leak my IP? Is there any networking thing? Ignore my RAM usage. Oh no. <laughs> 22 gigs. Okay, we're actually near the very end of the compilation. When you see this echo timestamp, this is one of the last thing that has to happen. I don't know why it takes so long, but uh, <laughs> so it says it'll only leak your local IP log. All right, then we good, then we good. As long as IPv4 is fine. Oh no, we're dropping more frames. <laughs> oh no. So it says you can turn that off though. All right, all right, we'll take a look. How long did this take, by the way? I'm pretty sure it took 40 minutes, right? We started like 20 minutes into the stream with this toolchain.sh. That was a 45 minute compilation. There's not much to do after this, which is why I'm saying this. Look at my CPU number, by the way. It's all the way up at seven. I've never seen that. Have you seen seven for the CPU usage in Emacs? That's insane. I've, how high did that number get? I just recognized it. It may have been higher before. That's insanity. <laughs> oh, man. Okay, we're dropping more frames. Encoding overloaded. That dang CPU. <laughs> I'm just happy it's still going. I'm happy it's still going. Uh... <laughs> we're doing it so at this point we're all the way at the bottom we are making all of these gcc targets and i'm pretty sure this echo timestamp is one of the last things to do in install target libgcc as you can see lib libgcc is what we were building so hopefully all we're gonna do is uh after making libgcc, we're just gonna install them. And then we, which is basically just copying files, takes like 10 seconds. And then we good. And hopefully at some point, my CPU will, will relinquish control back to me and uh, we will be able to do things once more. Did you see how slow Discord was? I've never seen that animation lag <laughs> just for opening an image. Yep, there's our big link. That was taking the long time. We have little bits that we got to deal with now. Libiberty. What is Libiberty for? I always have fun saying it. Libgomp, Libiberty, Libma prefer Libmumpka. What? I don't know what LDL is. That's probably something I should know. Sorade says, I usually build LLVM with 30 or 31 threads rather than 32 because of that. Oh, nice. <laughs> nice, yeah. Here's it. It's doing all the installing. Beautiful stuff. You can see all five make threads, make jobs happening there. What are we doing now? Okay, there's more. <laughs> No, it should be done really soon. Yeah, we're... Oh, we have to compile libgcc with no red zone due to x86-64. So we're compiling another version of libgcc. That way we can actually have the uh, the stack not killed. Sorry, it says, because if I don't, I can't use my PC for like 20 minutes. Yeah, that's where I'm... Oh, we dropped many frames again. <laughs> oh, this is scary, man. Like every five seconds, my OBS, just everything turns red. The bitrate, red. For FPS, red. Average time, red. CPU usage, red. <laughs> and then I get encoding overloaded warnings. OBS is yelling at me. Also, we're on 3.6 megabytes of standard out. <laughs> That's a good point. That's incredible. We're, I think we're going to get to 4.2. <laughs> Just run like a token on it. Toki, what is it called? 
So it says, or million lines, I don't know. That's definitely megabytes. You can see the amount of lines here on the left. <laughs> 13,000 lines. And this is like, this is without verbose on. Can you imagine if we had verbose on? Can you imagine if we had verbose on? I don't even, also we did it. It's done. Oh my God. Chat, it happened. Yay! Give me a pog champ. We did it. <laughs> that took like 40 minutes. Oh my God. That was rough. <laughs> Sorry, it says, yeah, three megabytes of standard out. Just sounded so absurd that I had to do a double take, lol. Pog, 3.7 megabytes. Should have timed it. That's true. <laughs> Hindsight is 2020. Woo! Well, there's that done. To uh, ensure that it works, you can uh, just test out in here. There should be a bunch of things. See? All these are executables. So we can test out G++. Oh, look at that. 12.1.0. Ooh, look at that. Sorade says, no problem that you didn't time it. Oh, you're the best, Sorade. Thank you. Just do it again and time it this time. <laughs> oh, no. No, you had me in the first half. Not gonna lie. May. <laughs> also, Daniel B with a pog champ. Shout out Daniel B. Thank you so much for being excited, because I'm excited. <laughs> but yeah, we have everything here. So now we have the whole GNU tool chain for Lenser OS. Woo! Uh, so if we do something like, what is it, dump machine? It's not dump machine. What is it? I don't remember what it is. Maybe that's not the uh, G++. Is that to bin utils? I don't even remember. Anyways, we have a cross compiler. So what does this mean? We built this compiler on Linux. <laughs> and it also runs on Linux. Does that make sense? So Linux is where it will run. Linux is where it was built. And then the programs that this compiler will compile will run on Lenser OS. Does that make sense? It's a little confusing. I know there's three separate things, which is target host and uh, build. It's GCC dash dump machine, duh. Oh, rip. I never do it. There it is. Look at that. It's correct. It's not just the name of the executable. It's actually what GCC thinks the machine that it is on. It is on Lenser OS, baby. Oh, that's so good to see, by the way. That's so good to see. We did it. We have done it. It works. We built an entire tool chain for Lenser OS from scratch, patched with, by the way, I included this, auto dereferencing dot. So in C, when you use this compiler, the programs that you compile can actually use dot on pointers to structs or unions. So you can have like struct foo with stuff in it, right? And then you can say struct foo pointer equals new foo or whatever. Let's call it C++. And then guess what? Also, I think I have to do that. All you have to do is say foo dot stuff. Whatever's in here, you can just use the dot. It doesn't matter. It's auto dereferencing. Ain't that cool? Ain't that cool? Little patch to GCC. Do you want to see how simple that patch is, by the way? Can I open read only? Find file read only. Perfect. I don't I just don't want to screw up the patch in case you didn't couldn't tell. Uh here's the patch. Here it is in GCC. That makes it so that dot can be auto dereferencing. It's a complicated diff, ain't it? <laughs> That's it. Right there. Isn't that cool? I just think it's so cool how something that seems so complicated, like auto dereferencing, is like this diff. <laughs> Ruark says, wait, we are done? We actually are partially done. <laughs> We're done with the tool chain. So now we can, as uh, you can see, we can run our tool chain. We get the version, it runs, it's it's a it works. It the works. So now we're done with the tool chain 
And if you remember from way back when, we came here from here. We're supposed to be building the kernel. Bruark says 13,546 lines. I like that. Yeah, yeah, that's where we at. That's where we at, baby. It was also 3.7 megabytes of standard output. How do you like that? Sarade says, also, seeing as you've implemented a mini libc in Lenser OS, I sort of feel the urge to try and add some SIMD optimized memcopy implementations, etc. lol. Yes! Sarade, that would be sweet. <laughs> that would be amazing, Sarade. That would honestly be so cool. Having an optimized memcopy is like... Ugh. And since Lenser OS is x86-64 only, that's like, that's perfect. That's literally perfect. Rourke says, holy shit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was some, it was some, some killer, some killer vibes. Anyway, this is where we were, if you remember. We were just building the tool chain. Once the tool chain is usable, continue on here. Boy, that took a while. I recommend taking a look at config.cmake and seeing what there is to fiddle with, but going with the defaults is just as well. Let's take a look. Also, I can use my computer again. Yay. So the kernel has a configuration. Sarade says, compiler intrinsics time. Ayy. As long as it works, it's GCC only, so who cares? I mean, the, the kernel itself should be able to be used with Clang as well. I'm pretty sure. Sarade says, uh, or assembly time, I guess, if compiler intrinsics don't work, but I'm assuming they do. Yeah, so we still have all the compiler intrinsics of GCC. We, have every, we should have all of them. Sarade says the intrinsics are an Intel standard. We may not have them. <laughs> we, may, we definitely may not have them. I don't know. If they work on Linux, in the Linux kernel, then I would assume they work in the Lenser OS kernel, because the GCC setup is very similar. That's the Imintrin header in Friends. I immediate intrinsics, okay. King Bun says, at least this wasn't Rust compile times. It's true. It's true. It was only like 40 minutes. How bad is that? You know, really? Uh, so what this says is settings and options may be set during project configuration like so. You can use, again, your regular CMake generation command, but with dash D and then the option and then equals to whatever you want to set it to. So this will eventually allow us to change architecture, which I don't even want to think about doing. Nothing would even... No. You can set the uh, machine to VBox. This is because VirtualBox is very buggy <laughs> and has a lot of issues where like the HPET timer doesn't work at all. But in QEMU, it works fine. So if you're using QEMU, go ahead and change this to QEMU. I recommend that heartily. But uh, choose like VBox. And if you're wondering what you can change it to, there's a list here in case you were curious. So it says, didn't I show an example of me using AVX Intrinsics on Discord the other day of Memexor32 in my networking library? That's right, you did, with the 256 byte operations. We talked about that. You can ha hide the UART color codes. So if your terminal doesn't support the color codes and escape sequences, the output looks horrid <laughs> because it's just riddled with escape sequences that's meant to be color. So you can hide the color codes uh, by default, which means that there's actually no color in the output. And then QEMU debug, which starts QEMU with dash s dash s flags, halting startup until a debugger has been attached. I use this to attach GDB to QEMU, and then you can actually uh, debug your kernel as, as it boots up, which is nice. So it says, I routinely just put escape sequences in the source code, lol. I did. And then I wrote a function that removes escape sequences and doesn't print them. So it says, also, here's the function I was talking about. I'm going to check it out. I click on links from Sir Raid. I'm a simple man. Uh-huh. Okay, so, oh boy. So if you have AVX, we do have SSC2 and AVX, but it takes a while for us to set them up in the kernel. So you'd have to make sure that we actually set up uh, SSC2 and AVX 
using CPU ID, I think we have to do some complex stuff in kernel stage one. Like the middle of kernel stage one is when we actually set up AVX and SSE and enable them. So, I mean, that's definitely doable. I don't think we even do MMX. <laughs> I think it's so old. We're just, nah. Fun fact, if the memory isn't aligned properly for SIMD, it's seg faults. That's true. <laughs> oh man, AVX512. I don't think the QEMU supports AVX512, but we have AVX at least with uh, 128. Cool. This is very cool. But I think something like this definitely may work in Lenser OS. There's just going to have to be a switch where we use one mem copy before K stage one and one mem copy after, or after a certain part of kernel stage one. Okay, let's actually build our OS, huh? We can now just use CMake. So let's do that. So we can now go back to the top level. I'm also just going to clear a little bit. <laughs> and uh, what we're going to do is run exactly the command that I see there. How about that? <laughs> That's right. We got to use WSL. Don't be dumb like me. Uh, I probably have to remove the file, the folder now. Yeah. Uh, remove dash RF kernel slash build. That's scary. CD kernel. <laughs> remove dash RF build. <laughs> CD dot dot. That's better. Uh, CMake dash build, blah, blah, blah. WSL. <laughs> No, CMake 3.2.0 or higher is required. You are running version 3.16.3. No. Uh, does this work? We're going to try. It did not work. It's probably waiting for me to enter a, a password, but it didn't flush. Uh, like that. Okay, so we're going to go to a real terminal. King Bun says WSL sudo, Lamau. Uh, pretty much. So cd dot dot. Okay. Okay. I was like, I thought I knew it. CMake is already the newest version. Well, that's a rip. <laughs> also, reminder to try installing BTOP if you're interested. It's a good idea. I'll just do it. Okay. Bye, guys. I'm pretty sure me switching you guys is what's screwing it up. Unable to locate package BTOP. Perfect. Perfect. What is BTOP? It's this thing in the Discord. You should check it out. This thing. It's very cool. It's like HTOP, but fancier. <laughs> Lamau. <laughs> so many drop frames. It's so bad. <laughs> Three to four browser windows with 30 tabs total. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> Java moment. What is our issue? CMake 3.20 or higher is required. What was the original? I could not find CMake using the following name, blah. So everything's going fine in WSL, except for that we don't have a high enough CMake version. Do we have to build CMake? <laughs> I don't remember how I did this. CMake 3.20.
When did it come out? I don't even know. Just change the CMake version. Well, I, that's what I want to see, what they add. Why do I, why is it set to that? Hmm. We'll try it. I'm pretty sure we need the newest version. I don't know. Bug it. <laughs> Yeet. <laughs> Unknown command C make path. Yeah, there's there's the kicker. Also, you can just download the latest C make binaries for Windows. We're doing a Linux build. Uh, cmake.com slash download. Is it downloads? I can never remember CMake. Okay. It's apparently downloads. Is it dot org? It's probably dot org. Yeah, download. We did it. Okay. What do we do? Uh-huh. So can I download this on Windows? Does that make any sense? What version are you using in WSL? How do I even know? How do you know which version of Ubuntu you're using? I don't know what command to run to figure out what WSL is. I'm pretty sure I just clicked the Ubuntu on the stupid Windows store. I've gone there once. <laughs> So this should be Linux source. If we just get executables, we should be able to run them. This is binary distributions. Run lsb underscore release dash a. Why do I not trust that? <laughs> it's just, it looks sketchy. What am I releasing? Dash a looks like an all flag. It's a little scary. Rourke says, yeah, it's safe. Trust me. <laughs> Kappa. Oh, man. It looks correct. It looks correct. <laughs> I, I usually trust Serade, but uh, <laughs> when I see release dash A, it, it weirds me out a little. Uh, We did it. <laughs> it's 20.04. LTS. Horrible. We should just update Ubuntu on stream. Okay. So it says, okay, <laughs> you're using the old Ubuntu version. I mean, it's, it was the one that came up. Maybe specifically install the 2204 app on the Windows Store. It might be easier. That sounds like a yikes. Okay. Also, you can't update the version. What does that mean? You'd have to set up WSL again. That's fine. I didn't set it up, really. <laughs> and I know how annoying that is. I just, I literally clicked one button, and that's all I've ever done. <laughs> Lander XD said, wait, Lens actually read my suggestion after about six messages. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I'm sorry. There's so many chats going on right now. Lander XD says, can't believe I nearly missed the stream. I have CMake 3.22 on Ubuntu WSL. Are you using 2004 or 2204? Sorry, Lander. Your name is the same color as Sir Aids. I literally thought you were the same person. It's exactly the same color. <laughs> we're just copying uh, some stuff in the background right now. Don't worry about it. Perfect. Perfect. That thing. Uh, slash mount slash d slash 
program bin slash cmake. Pretty good. Uh, cmake dash g unix make files dash s kernel dash b kernel slash build. We did it! Fuck yeah. And Lander XT, is that better? He changed his name to Bright Red. That's much better, actually. That's nobody else's red right now. Roark says Lender should add a chat box so he doesn't have to read all the chats. But then what would I say? So it says it's written in C, so just run make dash J. <laughs> so it says, oh, and that was also unrelated, but you can download BTOP and build it manually. Let's do it. <laughs> Roark says not all of them, though. I mean, read them out loud. But then what would I say? Lander XT says, well, he still needs to read them to get our ideas. Exactly. I don't have any ideas. So it says, please just alias that to CMake, lol. Eh. <laughs> We're good. Build BTOP in a proper terminal, though. All right, we'll use, like, Windows Terminal. I'm pretty sure I can open WSL in it. Is this an insult to C++? It's not, actually. They have really fancy build output with colors and everything. I mean, eShell supports colors. I just typed the URL of the LenderOS Git repo and forgot to type git clone. <laughs> you just open it in the browser. <laughs> Ruark says Windows Terminal. It's better than CMD, are you kidding me? LenderXT says, do I have dementia? <laughs> Maybe. Were you here for the 40 minutes where we were compiling a compiler? <laughs> Took so long. Okay, so we now have done it. We can now run cmake dash build, dash dash build, I should say, without all this configuration crap. And uh, we have to specify a target as well, if you, if you uh, didn't know. So our target, I'm pretty sure if we just do this, it'll tell us the target. Huh? Here's all of our targets. You can see each file gets its own target, so you can build each file individually. But you can also, you see there's some, some things here. We have image GPT, image ISO, image raw. How about that? Hmm? How about that? <laughs> uh, so what this is, is basically the OS is now able to be built but building it just gives you an executable. <laughs> so that's not that helpful, really, when it comes to an OS. So we have these uh, targets to specify to actually build boot media in some certain way. So GPT stands for GUID partition table. ISO means make an ISO, a disk file. And RAW means just make a bootloader, like RAW disk file with everything that Lenser OS needs. Pretty sure I should go image GPT. Rourke says, okay, it's better than CMD, but both of them are Windows. <laughs> Not like this. I'm sorry for hating on Windows, but it's Windows, okay? No need to be sorry. So it says, no need to apologize for hating on Windows. Exactly. Rourke says, okay, fuck that shit, Lamau. <laughs> and look, we've now generated this hard drive which has a start LBA and end LBA. By the way, I wrote the program, create GPT. I wrote this program. <laughs> I had to. Isn't that fun? Lander XT says, how can you be a C, C++ programmer and use Windows? Uh, stubbornness. Rorx is right. But look, we did it. We built the target. It's a 48 megabyte hard drive, boot drive, I should say. This is so bad they made WSL to literally run Linux. I mean, you're not wrong. So look at that. Look at that. GPT stands for GUID partition table. ISO stands for make an ISO. I see how it is. You don't know what ISO stands for. No. <laughs> International suck off. I don't know. It's not that. It's not that. <laughs> Ruark says ISO stands for ISO. That's correct. <laughs> Ruark knows what's up. Uh, so as you can see, we now have an executable, which if we look at, we can just say, what are you? And you see it's literally just an ELF 64-bit executable. 
because that is what we built in our bootloader. In the LensRS bootloader, we built an ELF <laughs> executable builder, like runner. It loads an executable and runs it in the bootloader. And this is what it uh, does. And then that's been encoded into lensrs.bin. <laughs> that's lensrs.bin, not kernel.bin. I was like, what? It doesn't exist. <laughs> And you can see that it is a DOS MBR boot sector. So this is a FAT32 GUID partitioned thing, which has a start and end here, blah, 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 with an extended partition table at the end. How beautiful is that? Sarad so says, tell me about it. Compiling my stuff for Windows is the bane of my existence sometimes, especially networking code. Yeah, networking code on Windows can die in a hole. So you can see lensros.image, this looks like it's the actual FAT32 itself uh, disk. So this is the actual file system, just raw, in a file, 48 megabyte file system, with the lensros executable, the fonts that it needs, stuff like that. ISO files are international organization for standardization, apparently. IOS? What? <laughs> Lander said, surely that's iOS, though. That's what I was just like, what? Are you sure? Press X to doubt. Sraid says, no.iso. The internet says ISO. It is ISO, but International Organization for Standardization is iOS. The file format is literally named after the ISO, Lamel. You mean the iOS. <laughs> the ISO file format is named after the iOS. <laughs> the Organization for Standardization. Lamel. And it's International Standards Organization. Oh, man. What CMake do I have on Windows? I have a good CMake. Let's try and do the same thing. I don't think I need quotes. Yeah, what happened? Could not find CMake compiler, so I'd have to build it for Windows. That's fair. In any case, I should be able to run QEMU uh, somehow. Let's go scripts. Run hda.bat. Okay. So. We have, we have, we're, we've arrived. This is going to try and load OVMF and from lensrs.bin, which we did do. So all we have to do is run this little batch file. So we're just going to take you here. We're going to say scripts. Run hda.bat. It's been so long since I've done this. Oh my god, it's working! Chat. Chat. <laughs> Bog. Oh, wait, wait. Oh! Hey! <laughs> we did it! I'm loving it. <laughs> Yay! We did it, chat. This is Lenser OS. We did it. Oh my god. I didn't know if it would work, but we did it. Chat, we did it. Lender XT says, what? <laughs> I know, we did it. It only took an hour and a half. Sarade says, it's only CHF 138. Oh, Christ. Which is like $139. Ruark says, the boot sound, PogChamp. Ruark, Lenser OS, PogChamp. <laughs> Sarade says, Pog, yes. Do, 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 do a barrel roll. <laughs> this is so awesome. Welcome all to Lenser OS. Uh, well, up. <laughs> That's a big nose. So good. Whee. Also, it's I don't know how to fix this bug. If anyone actually cares, when I press the down arrow, it disappears. Please tell me why. It's so confusing. <laughs> Every other way works, left, right, up, but down, 
and it fucking disappears and then reappears. You can hold up, you can hold left, you can hold right, but holding down, fuck no. <laughs> it's taken so long for me to do that. <laughs> Okay, uh, along with typing, all the ASCII characters, do not try to type something that's not ASCII, you may break things. Uh, by typing ASCII characters, you can get uh, everything. We have some symbols, which were hand-coded into the kernel. Most likely, your down arrow code is just slow. Okay, is that a challenge? Is that, is that a challenge? No, I'm kidding. Let's take a look at it. Uh, yeah, keyboard.cpp, cursor. So when we draw the cursor, here, here it is. It's right at the top of keyboard.cpp. Also, yes, Eglet, I understand. Please shut down all. You're gonna freak out at this. Lando XD says, I have an idea. Rewrite it in Python. That'll be faster. Yeah, we'll just port the entirety of Python right on over to Lenser OS. <laughs> hey. Also, I'm really happy these are staying aligned. That's good. You can see that uh, since we compiled with VBox, oh, I have I have colors. I forgot I can draw with the mouse. Oh, what should I do? I don't want to go against t toss. I can't. I can't be tossed. Lender XT says, "Yep, makes sense." So even Lenser OS users can experience slow code. Lamal. Uh, what do we do? Let's draw something. So this is just using a very simple drawing mechanism. Every time you get an event that the mouse moved to a position, we just draw a box there. And if you right click, it randomizes the color using a, what is it, linear feedback shift register randomizer. And you can make uh, just crazy things, keep switching colors. I like going outside, so you just make it a little layered. <laughs> oh yeah, this this guy is looking nice. I'm gonna give him a nose. His nose is gonna be all the colors. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> Yeet. How about that? <laughs> so it says draw the C++ logo, lol. I don't even know what that is. I'm 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 uncultured. <laughs> Lender XT says copyright contributors to Lenser OS. You act like that's not just you and Serade. That's literally not, Lander. You're, you are a part of that. <laughs> you, you are one of them. This is yours just as much as mine, according to the license. Which means we're never re-licensing, because I'm not tracking all of you fuckers down for a re-license. So hopefully GPL v3 uh, remains legally enforceable, or any later GPL. I think we have GPL v3 or later. <laughs> Sir Aid says built-in support for dotted lines, nice, <laughs> yeah. Lender XT says, my incredibly rough licensing code you needed to fix in seven separate commits. Pretty much. <laughs> Listen, your code was not bad. I want to, I do want to iterate on that. Your code is not bad at all. The reason I had to change most of it was because of an OCD thing. And I was like, the, the C++ comment style isn't, uh, we usually put stars in front of all of the lines right? But there were no stars. So I just added the stars. That's pretty much all of the commits. The other ones were just like uh, the shell the shell files and stuff in subdirectories that you missed, like the storage and memory subdirectories. So we basically, what do we do? Cursor down. Uh, keyboard scan code translation. Hey, look, ASCII. Uh, 
This is a really good idea. I gotta use this pattern more. This is like a map, but a static map that's easy to uh, initialize in C++. I gotta take my own ideas. So we translate a scan code. Where do we actually call translate from? Did I search wrong? Yeah. So we call translate here after handling a character. So we parse a scan code. And if we get arrow down, we do cursor down. Where's cursor down? Probably in here. So it can be inlined. Also ignore the errors. Sarad says, should be const experts <laughs> shaking my head. The compiler is probably optimizing that for you anyway, but still. Yeah, I wrote all this code six months ago or more. I did not know, even know const expert was a thing. <laughs> I promise. Lander XT says, how do I deal with being famous? I have one GitHub follower. <laughs> That's funny. That's really funny. Uh, I don't know. You're going to have a hard time, man. It, but it's really troublesome. So if size and characters y minus amount is less than... It seems like this is wrong. So if the size and characters minus the amount we would like to move... Wouldn't that be cursor up? Am I insane? How does this code make any sense? If amount is greater than cursor position. What? No, no, okay. <laughs> kill me. If I, I, I know I wrote that, kill me. That doesn't make any sense, I don't think. I'm surprised it works. So when we go to the bottom, I mean, it just stays at the bottom. If we go to the top, it just stays at the top. I don't know how this works. That code is so you don't underflow the cursor. Ah, I see. I'm getting it now. I'm getting it now. I.e. so you don't go up more lines than there are. I'm, yeah. So, <laughs> cursor up means Y goes down because we're top left coordinates. That's what was getting me. I was like, wait, how is cursor up? Aren't these backwards? I was like, doesn't this have to be here? <laughs> but yeah, cursors going up mean y, their y position goes down. So if it's greater, then it's just going to be set to zero. This makes a lot of sense now. Cursor down, we basically say if the total size minus the amount is less than cursor position. Okay, so that basically means that at the very bottom, minus how much we want to move. If the cursor position is uh, in between that, then obviously we can't move that far down. We just go to the bottom. So that's what that does. It caps us off at the bottom. Okay, this is starting to make sense. I just looked at it like, how does this work? <laughs> this does not seem like it makes any sense. Same thing with left and right. So there's cursor down, uh, which is called here. So after we do that, we break, means Gotti zero equals false. And then we can pop out to here. So it says, also, I like that you're using U64, etc. Yeah, I did. <laughs> I did like it. The problem is that if you want to make some, I did, I used U64 where I should have used U size. You know what I mean? I'm pretty sure we have it in integers.h. Yeah. So here you can see all of our integer declarations. Also, I don't know why I didn't use a type def. Yeah, u size is good to have. We're just going to add it. Uh, I should be using USZ more. I really should too. S64 though, that's a bit cursed, honestly. Why? <laughs> I 
I prefer I-64. What, how does that make any sense to you? So you have a signed integer and an unsigned integer. And you're going, let's abbreviate them. Yeah, this makes sense. Let's abbreviate them I-64 and U-64. Let's use this one and this one. <laughs> Why? Why? You and John Blow are the only people I've ever seen use S64. Everyone uses I64. Why? If you can explain to me why this would be I64, why do we use int instead of signed and unsigned? They already start with different letters. Just use them. <laughs> unsigned, uh, signed, uh. Sorry, it says because it makes sense. <laughs> it doesn't make sense. This makes sense. It's readable. Signed, 64-bit, integer is implied unsigned 64-bit integer. That's how you'd say it. It's how you'd write it. It makes sense. This is like integer 64. How does that make any sense? Lender XD says it makes about as much sense as my lag. You can also use int and int 64t and not signed and signed 64t. True. Signed is the default. That's why it just says I. Why do you have to specify I? That's my question. Like, if you're going to say, oh, assigned integer is the default, then just just have it be like, oh, 64. Is the, that's a 64-bit integer. <laughs> default, baby. If you want to write numbers, you got to affix that shit. <laughs> Lender XT says, you just had nothing to say about that. Well, life doesn't make sense. None of us really have anything uh, down. Uh, yeah. Looking good. So, I really should put an upper bound on parse character. <laughs> I mean, I guess it can only go to 255. But if this draw cursor code is truly just too slow when going downwards versus upwards, I would be surprised. I tried to optimize it as much as possible. That's why I have all these vector multiplications and uh, things like that. It really helps, you know, optimize it. So it says, I don't know, you got to benchmark it. <laughs> I was just being sarcastic, bro. <laughs> it's not optimal at all. <laughs> don't forget to download and compile BTOP. Okay. Okay. Why not? Lender OS is running stable. Also, that's today. We're using the RTC correctly. I'm pretty sure that's broken on VirtualBox. Download and compile BTOP. Let's do it. I'm going to put dollar signs in this guy's eyes really quick. I don't like that. Yeah. <laughs> How about that? <laughs> I don't know why I like that so much, but I do. Don't forget to download and compile BTOP. And yes, I'm going to keep using eyes even if it doesn't work on Twitch. Not using eyes would severely limit my ability to communicate. Well, also, it works. It works. Eyes work. It's a better TTV emoji, apparently. <laughs> I agree with the, you, though. I, I do that a lot. He says, just do make dash J. I've already tested it. I. Fuck it. Uh, where do I download it to? Yeah. Oh, by the way, we didn't look at the debug output of Lenser OS at all. Look at this beautiful, beautiful debug output. Mmm. Oh, yeah. Beautiful. So here's where the bootloader starts. Let's also get another WSL thing going. Oh, no. <laughs> it's going to leak my IP. Oh no, that was close. Oh my god. 
That was so close. Oof. It literally just leaked my IP as soon as I clicked away. It literally just leaked my IP. I, I saved myself so fast. Holy shit. <laughs> it should only leak your local IP though. Nope. This is, this is definitely not my local IP. It's, uh, I think it has to do with, uh, the, the virtual, like virtual box creates new network, uh, new network drivers and stuff. <laughs> Ooh, that was so close. Oh, the nervousness, the nervousness. Uh, yeah. If it doesn't start with 192 or 10, then it's not the local IP, lol. Yeah, it was not the local IP. <laughs> Ooh. Anyway, just double checking my screen. Okay, we're good. We are back. <laughs> Ooh. I, love, uh, I love little moments like that to really get your blood flowing as a programmer. Ooh. Okay, that was good. That was good. Goddamn virtual box. Maybe it's Hamachi. Maybe Hamachi did it. I don't even know. <laughs> okay. So, why does it even list all the, your IP, like your Ethernet connections? It's, <laughs> I don't care. It's fine. Everything's fine. We're going to do a Git clone. I'm literally writing this from by hand, because why not? Uh, from github.com. Aristocratos. Sorry, says because it's a server OS. That's probably why it lists the IP. Lamau, probably right. Arch doesn't do that. I gotta get Arch. Is there an Arch WSL? Hopefully this is fine just in the home directory, by the way. I'm trusting you. Oh, nice. <laughs> That's awesome. This is really cool. Required flag standard C20. Oh, no. What build system is this? Did he do this by hand and make? Is he insane? Oh my, really nice build output. Okay, we're stealing this. How did, how did this happen? Rip, I forgot I'm not on Windows. <laughs> the executable is in bin B top, all right. It's going to leak my IP. I just, I have a feeling. Okay, it, it only leaked the local IP. I think we're good. I'm still going to, how do I disable it? <laughs> okay, you press Q to get out of it. Is there a way to, uh, hopefully this works. Okay, so there's no non-networking stuff there. Probably in it, huh? Oof. You can type three to turn off the networking. Okay. Oh, Lamau. Cool. Well, that's dope. <laughs> you can see my horrible CPU specs now. <laughs> it's abysmal. I'm just comparing it. Serade's output. It's a joke, man. It's a joke. Your terminal apparently doesn't support the fancy formatting. What fancy formatting? Mine looks fancier if you compare them. <laughs> what a flex. Goddamn, Serade. Ooh, yours does look much fancier. I'm sure I just don't... I, I have a different CPU as well. You have like bars. Yeah, I don't have any of that. What is four? This is process. 
So this would only catch processes in WSL, which would work for our compilation. Jesus, fuck. <laughs> Four is processes. Oh no, I clicked one. I didn't, I didn't know I could select things. I thought this was, oh no. Uh, four. Okay, just go away. <laughs> I'm scared. So they have the C drive as the root, apparently. And then we have a swap file. <laughs> Crazy. Two is memory and disks. Yeah. Coolness. This is a lot. The time? I kind of just want to leave this up like full screen. <laughs> this should just be my desktop. I only ever come up and open Emacs anyway. Fancy. This is really cool. We'll definitely have to look at this the next time we compile. I'm, I think just running this may break my computer though. <laughs> it may be rough. So it says, it's nice to look at, isn't it? It is. It really is. Can I save preset? Is that what that means? Okay. There, there's the local IP. It only updates every two seconds by default, so it's going to be fine. Yeah. It could be. Do you see how much RAM is available? <laughs> it's not good. Running this while running the compilation may just it it may just break everything. What is tree? Oh, well, that's fun. R is reverse. Or core filter. Oh, you can search. Oh no. If you have four open while compiling, it's just going to be all CC1 plus or Clang processes, depending on what you use. CC1 plus, baby. <laughs> That's awesome. This is very cool. Uh, I really recommend downloading and building this. It's easy and fun, and uh, it's I'm sure it's useful. Very cool. Let's turn on color output for Lenser OS. Let's go draw a big smiley. Come on, give me a brighten. There we go. Yes, the creepiest smile. The dollar signs of the eyes. I like it. It's pretty good. <laughs> Are you feeling it now, Mr. Krabs? So it says, if you're using Linux and it's up to date, you can probably just install the BTOP package. At least that's what I do. Uh, building it and running it from source is much more fun. And you learn a lot more. Plus, I think it, that build system is worth it to point people to. I think their build system is really just a fancy make file. If it works, it works, man. BTOP looks simple enough where uh, that's okay. But I'm sure the make file is horrid. Look at our beautiful Lenser OS. Our time isn't that far off. Normally these are so hard to keep uh, in track and it really depends like which one do you use? Do you use real time or do you use the pit? <laughs> Most people tend to use real time and keep updating the pit based on the real time clock. So basically like every two seconds the pit timer would be reset to the, the RTC and keep counting from there. So it says, now I want to make a build system that's equally fancy, lol. I mean, Lenser OS, fun compiler, anything you want to do, let's do it. <laughs> no, it can be for anything. I'm not saying you have to do it for one of my projects. I'm just saying that uh, it's a great idea. They look great. But yeah, this is Lenser OS. You can't do much in it, can you? But uh, it sure is fun to open and uh, play around with and look at the code, see how it works. And let's get our color output and then go through all the debug output. 
Uh, da -da -da -da. That means I have to go into Emacs and build again, I think. Oh, what do I gotta do? The WSL. Yeah, that one. So I wanna build an image GPT, but I wanna reconfigure first. So where's the configure? Yeah, that's the one I tried. There we go. And now I basically wanna set the option. Where was it? Hide UART color codes equals op. Should be good. Kumu not found on your system. Kumu image not found on your system. Skipping image VDI target generation, blah, blah, blah. Basically, if you have Kumu, you can make more media. And then we can run our build again with GPT. Rebuilding the kernel here. There it goes. Now we're building the hard drive using Create GPT, a program that I wrote. It's available on GitHub. I don't know if it's free and open source. I don't know if I licensed it yet, but I should. You can see the size is 48 million bytes. And uh, we have a FAT32 partition on there, which is what this GUID means, or UID. Serade says, port the fun compiler to Lenser OS next fall. I mean, you're joking, but it's actually going to be easy. <laughs> Once we get uh, an actual like user space desktop environment going down, it's gonna be easy. Cause Lenser OS uses very basic C, or not Lenser OS, a uh, fun compiler uses very basic pure C with no dependencies. So it's basically just gonna be, you know, that's it. <laughs> it's just gonna be porting C library, which filling in the details. So it says, time to make insert language name here, the native language for this OS, lol. We'll just take over Yacht is what we'll do. I'm gonna be like, thanks Serenity OS for like building this for us. We're gonna use it now. And you can see we've rebuilt the kernel. We enter again, everything's the same, except for, look at all this colorful output. Look at this, we got rainbow, the rainbow road. <laughs> Let's take a look at all of this. From the very beginning, from bootloader to use, uh, well, sort of, user space. We are in user space right now, if you didn't know. It's just not uh, clear. So it says, nice, nice, nice. Colors, yes. Basically, the first thing that we do is the bootloader prints out a bunch of stuff. And it says, okay, kernel has been found. If the kernel isn't found on the file system, the UEFI file system, it'll error out here and say, hey, the kernel wasn't found. You ran the lens arrest bootloader, but the kernel not here, so not sure what to do. Default font loaded successfully. We load a font from the file system as well as the kernel executable, which means that uh, if this doesn't show up, you get a corresponding error message. Hey, there's no font. What are you doing? Uh, then we basically verify the kernel format. We make sure it's an ELF file and we make sure it's executable and we make sure that basically we're not just running a text file or some other thing that shouldn't be executed. Then we build the, uh, the ELF program. So we actually load the kernel segments uh, at one megabyte is generally the standard. Is that one megabyte? I don't even know what that is. Something like that. And you uh, you load it there because there may be like BIOS and stuff or like CMOS uh, data access in the lower RAM values and you don't want to screw things up down there. So you put the kernel somewhere up high so that it doesn't get in the way. Also of the bootloader itself, which is going to be somewhere. So we just guess at one megabyte and hope, hopefully there's nothing important there for the bootloader. Again, it's a very uh, naive bootloader. We load the, the kernel because we loaded the two program segments. Then we have to load GOP. GOP is the graphics output protocol of UEFI. Every bootloader has some stage of this. This is basically collecting all the data about monitors and frame buffers that you can write to and actually draw to the screen. So literally at the lowest level, you just get a frame buffer in memory and that when you 
write things there that shows up on the screen. That's the deal. And it says, here's where it is. Here's how big it is. Anything you write here, that will go onto this screen. It's this big, blah, blah, blah. Then we have to parse the EFI memory map. So EFI is basically this uh, boot environment that it's the replacement for BIOS, if you know what that is. And UEFI passes a memory map to the bootloader that says, hey, here's where all the memory we're using as UEFI is. Here's the memory you can use and not get in the way of everything. So to do that, we basically have to parse it and do some special stuff. You see that we find a root RSDP table, but the checksum's wrong. So we have to find one with the correct checksum. That one got me for so long. <sighs> there was like a straight week of getting that to work, I swear because checksums are also hard to calculate <laughs> or know if you're calculating it correctly. Uh, we set up the kernel entry point, which is OX blah, blah, blah. It's not shown here, but there's actually all Fs to the left of this. So this is OX FFFFF, FFFFF, or something like that, FFFF. Yeah, OX eight Fs and then this. And that's basically our kernel entry point in the virtual memory because that's like way up in the memory, out of the way of everything else. But the actual entry point, because we loaded it at a specific memory address, is this, which is all of that FFFF, FFF8. We basically just remove that section and take this lower part, because that's where it's actually loaded. Craziness, right? Linker script fun. And then, we calculate the kernel entry point. We exit boot services, which means like all this UEFI stuff. You can actually allocate memory with UEFI and like do a bunch of stuff there. We don't do much of that. You can also set up like networking and stuff like that, which we'll have to get into. But then once you exit boot services, that's like you're done with UEFI. You can't call it anymore until you reset the system. And then we finally enter the Lenser OS kernel and we say, hey, welcome to Lenser OS blinking. <laughs> Like, hey, we made it. We set up the UART driver, which is how we're actually putting this debug output onto the screen. This is a UART hardware chip. So this is a serial communications hardware driver that we initialize. And then we can uh, detect which actual hardware chip we are inter we're uh, communicating with. And we communicate it to it in the proper way. And then uh, it says, OK. We can talk to the user now. We initialize the driver, which is what this is proof of. And we're saying, okay, you're booting into it now. Here's where it's gonna get dicey. <laughs> we map the physical memory identity-wise in the kernel's page table. What does that mean? So basically every RAM address in x86-64 has something called physical addresses and virtual addresses. And this can be like OX0000 null may map to something like OX1000. And then when a, the actual program attempts to access, for example, load byte at OX1000, this is very rudimentary, but bear with me. Load byte at OX1000. This will actually, this actually loads at OX000 due to this virtual to physical mapping. So the physical memory at OX0000 is available at this virtual RAM address. Does that make any sense? So anytime you access RAM in C or anything like that, you're actually accessing the virtual memory. The hardware memory, you have no idea where you're actually, where it is. The user space program does not know, which is a large part of the point. In the kernel, however, we map the memory, the physical memory, 0 to 0 and 165A000 to 165A000. So accessing 0 actually gets you the address at 0. This is called identity mapping. And it allows for the kernel to have full control over all of the RAM on the machine. Ain't that fun? 
So we can fill it with all ones, fill it with all zeros. We could do whatever we want and it would access one to one on the hardware in the kernel. The problem is the kernel is in here, right? So what you can do is create another mapping to the same address, but a different virtual address. So now if you load OX1000 or 2000, this actually loads OX0000. Does this make sense? And in doing this, this means that we can map the kernel to a really high address range. It's literally like in the terabytes, if this was actually bytes. It's so huge, right? <laughs> it's insanity. But we map it way up in the address range so that the actual RAM can uh, be identity mapped. We can access all of it. We can, ac we can also execute in this other area which means that we can actually mark all of this RAM as not executable and mark this as executable, which means the kernel is only able to run itself and not anything in RAM given to it, for example, by a user space. Ain't that cool? Ain't that cool? And it, uh, it knows, like, it's self-evident. It goes, okay, where am I loaded at? Okay, so I'm loaded here, so which means we're here. So then we map this range here into this range here. You can even see the exact section mappings where like all of our code is stored, which is 88 kilobytes of code, technically kibibytes, but whatever. And then data, read-only data, and BSS. We can probably get BSS to be smaller. <laughs> and we only lost 3,377 bytes to page alignment, which is good. If that's bigger than one page, aka 4096 bytes, then that would mean we're laying out everything incorrectly. But this is pretty good layout in memory to keep everything adjacent and usable. We could probably put the RO data closer, but it's, uh, it's not up to us. I don't really care. <laughs> We'd have to then change our linker script a bunch. So after we set up our physical memory and we go, okay, I get it now. Our physical memory is this big. This is how much RAM we have. We set up an allocator. So if we look in Emacs, where were we? We set up in memory, a physical memory manager is what we call it. And this manages, you may have guessed it already, the physical memory. And it does that with a big giant bitmap. So we get a bitmap of all the bytes. <laughs> Not all the bytes, all the pages in physical memory. Sarade says, does the, does the kernel use your libc because the Linux kernel doesn't? No, it doesn't. It has its, the kernel is self-contained. It uses no libraries. Everything is written from scratch. Uh, but as you can see in memory, we have this page map which is our bitmap. And this is actually all of our pages, whether they are free or not. So when we allocate a page, we can lock it in this bitmap, which basically means we just set it. And we can keep track of how many are free and used and uh, stuff like that. So locking pages, you can lock a bunch of subsequent pages, stuff like this. And this is how we allocate memory. Oh man, it's been so long since I looked at this. <laughs> And uh, yeah, so when we actually are initializing, what you're seeing is init physical being called from K stage one, I think. So we have kernel.cpp. This is where we actually enter the kernel, K main. So K main is actually our entry point, and this is called by our bootloader. So our bootloader basically calls into here. It doesn't. It calls into our pre-kernel, but uh, if you want to figure out how this stuff works, you can. It's very complicated and hurts my brain. Any questions, let me know. So Raid says, also, since you have your own libc, and since this is an operating system, that means I can use underscore underscore identifiers. Pog, I like the underscores. <laughs> That's awesome. It's the small things, right? 
And you can see that K main, once we get here from our pre kernel, which I don't even want to, Jesus, I don't even want to get into it. Pre kernel is fucked. <laughs> Straight says, I don't know why. I, I know why. I know why you like the underscores. They look awesome. You're not wrong. It looks very technical and sweet. Also, everyone, you should get up and stretch. My back hurts. I'm gonna stretch right now. Should I get a webcam? <laughs> oh, okay. So, K stage one. Basically, you can think of it that K main is like our regular main entry point for our C program. K main is where we enter. And it immediately just says K stage one. And after that's done, you have now booted into Lenser OS. And K stage one is incredible. <laughs> oh, ye. Thread says, I, right, I'm gonna get up and get something to eat real quick then. Great idea. Great idea. I'm just gonna go over the basic uh, structure of Lenser OS, because it's awesome. Hi there. Oh man. There we go. That, <laughs> that went wrong. There. How do I go backwards a color? I keep coming out the right side. Yeet. <laughs> I'm just doing this because I, I'm standing finally. Feels much better to be standing. I don't, I've never found any drawing program that actually draws like this. It looks so unique to Lenser OS because <laughs> these types of dotted lines that are just like random based on how fast you move your mouse and how fast the events are coming in, the interrupt, it's like, it's actually really rare to see drawings that look like this. <laughs> you couldn't do it by hand, and you can't unless you're using like chalk on a blackboard. It works. Okay, so in Lenser OS, K stage one, oh, you can see that it basically does everything. <laughs> all of these are used, and these are all pieces from the kernel like the CPU, EFI memory, and the ELF loader, FAT definitions <laughs> for FAT32 file allocation table file system, and uh, KStage1 is a monstrous function which does an insane amount of stuff, which disables interrupts if they weren't already. That's what this does. That's right, inline assembly. How about that? So with this inline assembly, clear interrupt flag, this basically sets the R flags register, if you know how x86-64 works. It sets the flags register interrupt bit and it clears it. So this means that you're clearing the interrupt flag and that means that interrupts just won't happen. We will not be interrupted ever. This is the code that will run atomically on the CPU. Does that make sense? Hopefully that makes sense. So we disable interrupts. We ensure boot info pointer is valid because we kind of need boot info. And if it is not valid, that's a huge issue. What we should eventually do here is a checksum that's passed all the way from the bootloader. And then we can ensure that the boot info checksum is correct, which basically is a much better validation, but we're not there yet. That's just a security change we could make in Lenser OS. Uh, just close this. Uh, x86 specific, we load a global descriptor table and the interrupt descriptor table. So what this is, if you see setup G GDT, that's actually an assembly file. <laughs> Believe it or not, setup GDT basically assigns, I don't know why this isn't uh, static. I can probably just make this static. In any case, we set up the global descriptor table. And uh, this is complicated. Here's how it, how it breaks down. There are different 
privilege levels and different accesses and limits based on different uh, flags in this global descriptor table. So, for example, to enter user space, you actually just enter ring three, which has different, as you can see, different access and limited flags. Not limited flags, but flags. So the access and flags are very different between all of these, which means, uh, for example, you can't execute data. You can only execute code. And you can't uh, execute kernel code from user space. And you can't execute, uh, you can't access kernel data from user space. Things like that. The TSS is called the task state segment if I remember correctly. And uh, this is effectively there to make it possible to switch between the different uh, rings more easily for different tasks, like process switching, multitasking. Does that make sense? And it's the size. This is what got me for literally, again, a week. The TSS is the size of two GDT entries. Isn't that killer? <laughs> so the GDT entry, see how it's, uh, it, it's regularly just this size, right? 32 uh, bits, I'm pretty sure. Maybe 64 because of this. I can't remember. It's a certain size. The TSS is double that for like no reason. It doesn't even need to be double it. <laughs> it's just for fun. Oh, and then where are we? Not there. Okay, stage one. So after we set up the GDT, basically initialize it, we probably don't even need to do this. We can make this easier. We set the size to the size of the GDT, which is a page. It's in 4096. Uh, and we set the offset to virtual to physical GGDT. So we need the physical address in this actual place, but we only have the virtual address when we get this. As you know, the program works in virtual addresses. Sir Aid says, by the way, does LensROS support copy on write pages? It can, but not yet, because if it does, you can optimize mem copy quite a bit if performing a sys call that just copies the mapping. That's what glibc does on Linux. Yeah, that's definitely doable. We have the whole system in place for that, but we I didn't implement copy on write pages because it's hard. <laughs> but we do when we fork a program we are just going to copy and then uh copy the pages but then once they write to it we have to again that's exactly what you're describing copy on write it's just we haven't done that yet we're not that far into user space sadly also i just saw your mem move implementation i don't even know what that is i know what mem move is but i didn't know i wrote it i think that's going to be the first pr <laughs> I don't even have, where do I use memmove? I don't even know. <laughs> where is it, by the way? Memmove? I don't even see it. It's not here. It uses a variable length array. I don't, uh, where is memmove? <laughs> Where'd you find it? String.cpp. Oh, that's why it sucks. You're in libc. <laughs> uh-huh. That's in the libc. Yeah, libc I literally wrote in one day. In case you're wondering, I wrote this in one day. I just went through and did everything that I could possibly think of that I would need in the C library in one day. So they're probably very likely incorrect. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> oh no. Did I really write that? <laughs> Shit, me. Oh. <laughs> Sarade says rep move SB. That's one way of doing it. I think that's a good example of when assembly is slower than C, lol. Yeah. <laughs> Honestly, rep move SB sped, up, sped it up a lot. The frame buffer used to lag everything. But uh, it works 
okay now. Like a 1920 by 1080 frame buffer used to be undoable. It would just lag, but currently it's not too bad. But yeah, this is for user space mem copy. So whatever user space should uh should do, do that. <laughs> I don't know. Uh yeah, this is <laughs> this is I just uh yeah, feel free to make a PR. <laughs> I don't think anyone will complain that this is gone. But I did write it in one day. Maybe two. Pretty sure one. Because I I don't even remember writing it. <laughs> Sir Aid says the kernel in user space mem copy should be different functions than I take it. Uh, the user space one in libc will end up with very many. It should have a lot of validation checks that the addresses it's accessing are actually accessible by the program that's asking for the mem copy. User space is going to be filled with security. Kernel is going to be efficient. So in the kernel, you can actually go to memory.cpp, and this is the mem copy that we use here. Mem compare, mem set. That's actually not a bad mem set. Volatile read. <laughs> it could definitely be better, don't get me wrong, but it's not bad. Sarade says, I think it should be the other way around, if anything. How, why would the kernel make a bad mem copy call? That's what I don't get. Mem copy in the kernel will only ever be called by the kernel. Libc mem copy shouldn't really have to check anything. If it's not accessible, the kernel will just seg fault your program. Well, yeah, you can do that too. There's other things to rely upon. Like we don't have to check that it's not accessing kernel memory but we could check that it's accessing memory that's actually like uh, where it comes into play again is the like mem copy has to deal with in user space doesn't have to deal with validation I'm pretty sure I could be wrong mem copy in the kernel is just supposed to take two addresses and just copy that many bytes just do the job <laughs> this is such a weird unrolled loop I don't know how I came up with this. It is faster, but <laughs> it's such a weird loop. Sorade says, yeah, but I think only the kernel should be able and should have to check if something is mapped to a process. Maybe. I'm pretty sure it's... I'm pretty sure even on Linux you have like... Uh, in the proc file, doesn't it specify? I don't know, I could be wrong. If you mem copy to an invalid address in user space, it'll just issue a page fault and the interrupt handler will seg fault your program. At least that's how Linux does it. I mean, we could do it like that. That's, that's not preventative, it's reactive, but it's still okay. It just means the program will crash instead of saying this place at this spot had a big deal. Which, well, we could also have like a, a non-crash scenario handled by the interrupts. So in the interrupts, uh, we could have, what are we talking about? So when we get a page fault, this has a long way to go, by the way, I know. Uh, the page fault, checking every memory dereference would be infeasible, IMO. I, if, if, if you think it's not worth it, <laughs> I don't care. I'm not the one that's going to get hacked. I don't think any exploits for Lenser OS will even get made. But yeah, we panic if things go very wrong, as you can see here. Or here. But, uh... In any case, we could not panic. <laughs> Basically, we're saying if it's user super, and you're trying to... It's not present, or you don't have... Yeah. So we would, instead of panicking here, we would end the user process that caused the page fault. And then we would have to somehow, or we could try and somehow recover it and just give the process all zeros that what it read from 
and spit out an error message to the user. So it says the CPU takes care of checking that for you using page faults. So if you get a page fault, then you check, then you check what went wrong, I'd say. I mean, we already do that. It just means that, uh, again, it's reactionary versus preventive. It's fine. It's not a, I think it's totally uh, a way to go. Not too bad. But yeah, basically, just instead of panicking here, we'd say, hey, shut down the, the process and do a make a big deal out about, about it. Or just get, feed the process all zeros, whatever it was trying to read. But if it's trying to write and causes a protection fault, that's a big deal. So that'd probably be something else. Not bad, not bad. Okay. Also, I'm pretty sure these are broken if you wanna take a look at them. If you know what's wrong here, I would love to know. These don't work on VirtualBox at all. I think killing the process or signaling a seg fault is better than just giving it zeros. Why though? <laughs> Otherwise, the program will keep running, thinking that the read succeeded, and it'll break. I'll check the volatile functions later. Bless. But I'm pretty sure I've, I've narrowed it down. These don't work <laughs> on VirtualBox, and I'm pretty sure it's because of this exactly right here. We need memory barriers. <laughs> but I don't know how. I don't know how. I'm not, I'm not smart enough for memory barriers. M-Fence. Anybody? M fence? <laughs> That's a complicated way to say. We load the GDT. We set up x86-64. We prepare our interrupts, which uh, is pretty... Where is it? We have no prepare here. It's got to be somewhere. It's probably just above them. Yeah. So we remap the pick chip IRQs out of the way of general software exceptions. What does that mean? Software exceptions basically come in the form of all these page faults and stuff. And they are actually thrown by with this number here. And this number refers to the, uh, the type of exception that it is. So what's happening here is we're saying... All the things that are mapped currently in the the pick chip, we're going to remap them up and out of the way of all of these. So past uh, OX whatever. I think OX20 is what it's past. We create the IDT, the interrupt descriptor table, using an interrupt descriptor table red, uh, register or something like that. And... Uh, we basically install a bunch of interrupt handlers. I'm sure you're familiar with this, or it's similar to like binding events that we did in CNOPE. And then we flush, which just means, hey, actually update this thing. And what that calls, I can't remember what that calls actually, GIDT. Uh, interrupt somewhere. So the IDT you can see here. And you can see to flush it, we load the IDT, which is the memory address of this. We may want to use virtual the physical here. I'm not sure. We'll see. Obviously, it works. <laughs> uh, but yeah, there we are. So that was prepare interrupts. We set up UART initialize. So this is when we set up our driver, this thing here, as you can see. That's where we print this with debug message s, which is just a string. And uh, we init physical and init virtual memory, which here. And then we initialize the heap. So you know when like in C++ when you use new and delete? Yeah, we set that up. So now we can use new and delete after calling init heap in the kernel. And that's because we set up a little heap way up at this virtual address and uh, it's basically just allocates pages as needed. 
Sarid says, also, would you be fine with me maybe starting to implement part of the C++ standard library? No, I would not be fine with that. I feel like that could be useful since we're using C++ anyway. Yeah, no. <laughs> That's not the type of code we're writing. This is meant to be like the lowest level C++. Imagine that it's C, is what you should do, Sarid. <laughs> Imagine that it's C. With new and delete. And static casts. Also, don't use static casts like I did all over the place. Use regular C casts. It doesn't really matter that this is static. Does that make sense? Just just use parentheses. I did I did this thinking it would be better. It's not better. <laughs> it doesn't matter. The compiler knows better than I do. Just use functional style casts. Yeah, exactly. Int value. Exactly. You you have it right. With the parentheses. Just like that. First time chat from buffer OXAA55. Hello. Are you a bootloader? Are you the last two bytes of a of a of a bootloader sector? Sir? <laughs> I recognize those those bytes. Uh, but yeah, so after we init the heap, then we can create the system, which is like the system. So this is the kernel heap, by the way. But uh, the system itself just keeps track of quite literally everything. It keeps track of all of our CPUs, all of our system devices, so hardware that's connected, all of our file systems that we have set up and uh, found, and then all sorts of other stuff as well. File systems, devices, we have so much stuff. All stored in a singly linked list. Isn't that your favorite? <laughs> But Sir Aid, I'm scared of uh, like C++ standard lib stuff. I don't think we need any of that. We're sticking to C lib stuff. Buffer OXAA55, so some sort of. <laughs> Lamal. But yeah, so we init the heap, and then we debug it. You can see this is where it starts and ends. This is how big it is. And this is uh, our actual addresses. So you can see we have one thing in there. It's one header, it's free, and it's 4D71. Heap metadata versus payload ratio and used regions. Negative 9%. That may be a little broken. <laughs> it may be using uninitialized memory, I bet. So that's just in memory heap. But it's, it's, it doesn't matter, it's just the debug stuff. But when we heap print debug, Here's malloc, by the way, and free. When we heap print debug and do this little metadata thing, this is definitely broken. Used space efficiency starts at zero. One minus zero over used count times a hundred. This doesn't even make any, I don't, <laughs> I'm not convinced this is correct. Used count. What is that? Is it, is it just zero? Are we dividing by zero? We would get an error. It's being added here. If it's not free. But if that never happens, then this is zero, and we just divide by zero. <laughs> Lamau. Sarid says C++ standard lib stuff can be a bit hard to read sometimes, but it's not that bad. I just feel like having standard string and standard vector, etc. might be useful at some point. Yeah, nah, I'm good. Sarid says before that I'd have to implement malloc though, lol. We already have malloc. It's in here. It's right here. Malloc. Little, little, little part of the heap. Sarid says, by the way, is there a burk, suburk, or map, syscall, or something like that yet? No. Honestly, I barely know what those do as a Windows user, so, no. <laughs> Sarid says not in libc. We're not in libc, bud. Malik in libc is not implemented. Ah, I see what you're saying. I was like, we're not in libc. Yeah, Malik in libc is definitely not implemented because we're going to have to create a whole nother heap, a user space heap. I think the plan is to just make a new heap for every program, honestly rather than do it the traditional way where there's one big heap and all the programs get it. Why not just have each program get its own heap? Maybe it's a huge issue and we'll run into like memory usage, 
problems, but I don't think it's a problem. So Raid says, I see. That's why you're using a VLA, lol. Uh, what? <laughs> Probably because of Burke, Suburk, or Matt. Uh, but yeah, so you can see that we have our heap set up. We definitely have some things going wrong. And then we print out 64 bytes per char. And if it's an underscore, it's free. And if it's a star, it's used. So you see our little header takes up a little a little space at the beginning. But other than that, it's completely unused, baby. How about that? How about that? Either way, memmoot can be implemented without attempt buffer. Yeah, you just have to check if one's bigger than the other and then go one way or the other. You're exactly correct. And it's a much better idea. We then, uh, as you can see from case stage one, we initialize the real-time clock. So the real-time clock gets initialized here, as you can see. By the way, you can see the color codes coming into play. Uh, and debug message. Faithful, faithful debug message. And uh, we basically just say, hey, here's a bunch of things. Here it is. And uh, Buffer OXA855 says, I just checked your YouTube channel, man. It is a gem. Please keep continue as much as you can. Thanks. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. I recommend joining the Discord. You can get announcements every time I go live. And you, uh, you'll you never miss another, another stream, baby. And we also talk about crazy stuff like linguistics and uh, BTOP. And uh, you can get code review. If you want to see show off your code, you can get help if you're having troubles. I really recommend it. It's a ton of fun. Sarade says, what's the difference between debug message and debug message s? Debug message s underscore s just takes a string. So you can't actually pass in like things here. This won't work. You can't pass in formatted code. Debug message is formatted. Debug message s, no formats. Just a string. Sarade says, I see. It was, it's basically just to get around the fact that there, there isn't any way to tell whether this is just a string or just, or one of these. And it's really slow to print things out character by character to the UART driver. It's much better to print out buffers at a time. Sarade says, that's definitely an interesting naming convention. I don't think there is a naming convention. Honestly, I think I just made it up as I went. I didn't, this was, again, the first thing I ever wrote in C++ that actually I put time into. Before this was like being angry that I can't get a GUI program to link correctly with libraries. And I'm like, fuck it. I'm going to write an OS from scratch. <laughs> it, it, uh, it definitely was a good idea. But yeah, so after we set up the RTC, we print out what time it is, which is uh, cool. Now we know what time it is. The naming convention is the function name ends with F if it formats, and if it doesn't end with F, it doesn't format. Wonderful. <laughs> so print and printf, basically. I don't really care about that. <laughs> this is just for debugging. If you're a developer, you can learn to use debug message and debug message S. It's fine. It's I'm pretty sure it's all in one file. You can learn to just go here and look at what it does. Ah. Debug message C, debug message S, debug message buff, debug message, debug message, debug message, blah, 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 all the overloads, right? And then debug message V, which is a VA list. And then finally, debug message rainbow, which is one of my favorites. <laughs> That's how we get this rainbow output. It's fun, though. Draw boot graphics. This is just a function up in K stage one. And we say, draw some stuff. Uh, this actually uses the global renderer to draw to the screen. So in Lenser OS, if when we're booting up, if you look right here, like in this area here, there's a face and that's drawn right here. This draws a face. You can see left eye, left people, right eye, right people, mouth. Programmatically drawing a face is not easy, <laughs> but it's it's doable. 
Buffer OXA55 asks, how long have you been programming? Uh, a year? I, I mean, it depends on what you want to call it. 10 years to a year. Alexi just slid into the server. What's up, Alexi? Uh, that may be Buffer OXA55. Who knows? Who knows? In any case, yeah, I basically started programming seriously like a year ago. I started this OS. Uh, and uh, it's kind of all blossomed from there, as you can see on the YouTube channel. I made a text editor after the OS because I got kind of burnt out on the OS. I'm just getting back into it now. Buffer OXA55 says, yeah, it is me. Hey, shout out to Lexi for joining the Discord. Buffer OXA55, you're the best. Thank you. I appreciate it. We are going to have a great old time. Also, Sir Aid, did you know about this? Do you know about this horribleness? <laughs> I don't get x86-64 sometimes, but this is like one of the one of the places that's like, how is the world still functioning? <laughs> the OS has to provide 512 bytes, otherwise FX save and FX restore will crash the system and cause it to infinitely reset, which means restart. Sarayd says, oh god, context switch instructions, Lamal. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. The, an OS is, all it is, is context switching. That's all you're doing, constantly. After we get through this little bit, so you can see we've prepared memory, the real-time clock, the renderers, both the uh, drawing pixels to a linear frame buffer and the basic text renderer, which is a specific type of renderer which is better at, uh, it uses the global renderer, the global basic renderer to actually draw text and the cursor and yeah, it handles keyboard input and stuff. This is the bane of my existence. Determine and cache information about CPUs. It's scary. Also, we set up random number generators. I didn't mention that, but that's done here. This is just for fun. <laughs> I literally just... I just implemented random number generators for fun in the kernel. They, we really don't need them at all. They're just for the colors when you right click. That's literally it. But it was fun to write them. Sarade says, and yeah, in this case, the naming convention doesn't matter. Haha, <laughs> it's just that underscore S gives me PTSD because of Microsoft's stupid F open S functions and all of that nonsense. But F open is deprecated. <laughs> <laughs> I know exactly what you mean. I scream at my Visual Studio every time I open it. Like, it's F open is fine. <laughs> I promise. Oh, it kills me. It kills me. So, shut up, Eglet. You ain't right. Okay, so yeah, this is like one of the worst things in the world. Uh, It's, it's so bad. So we have to store the feature set of the CPU. So we create a CPU description, which will describe a CPU. And we call this the system CPU. This is basically thread zero, is what we're trying to figure out. What can we do on thread zero? But here's the thing. CPUs have more than one thread now. So CPU descriptions actually has a whole thing in it <laughs> as you can see, it it is used to create an actual CPU. And what we're going to have to do is create many CPUs. Do you see what I'm saying here? Currently, we, we have thread zero, basically, getting set up. We have to do this for every single core on the, or thread, I should say. Every single logical core. <laughs> Isn't this horrible? And we have to use CPU ID. Yeah, you know that CPU ID, that that assembly instruction, that's literally what we use to figure out this stuff. <laughs> Isn't that terrifying? We literally just call, okay, call CPU ID with this. <laughs> here's the string. We've we've done it. And then we just call it on reg. Isn't this horrible? 
Anyway, we have to do a bunch of multitasking stuff for when we want to set up uh, actual, you know, multiple threads, multiple cores, multi-threading. We're already multitasking, so we're good there. Buffer OXA55 says, did you write your own bootloader? Uh, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't. Currently, Lenser OS uses the GNU EFI bootloader from like 1990. It's old, okay? But it's it's somewhat open source. There's no license and it's been distributed everywhere with no problems. So it's mostly open source. Sir Aid says, I mean, you don't have multi-threading, but look at it like this. No threads, no deadlocks, no race conditions. <laughs> That's the problem. There are still deadlocks. <laughs> and we still have to do spin locks <laughs> because of hardware interrupts. I'm sorry. <laughs> there are race conditions. You're right, there are no threads, but there are still race conditions because of context switching. Also, this is incorrect. Now it's not. Oh, I broke everything. Oh no. Okay, it's fine. Everything's fine. So yeah, first thing we want to do is say if FX save and FX restore are supported, then try and support as much as you can. Try and support FPU and SSE. Does this make sense? <laughs> So, uh, again, there's links if you really want to know what to do in the code. So if a feature is present, its features flag is set in system CPU. This is what we're about to do in the giant if statement. So if fx save restore is enabled, then we can set fx save restore capable in the system CPU. Then we have to actually initialize FX save with our memory address. Did you know FX save could take a memory address? I did not. Anyways, then you say, okay, now it's been enabled. So not only are we capable of it, but it is ready to be used. It is enabled. And what this will be used for is like when CPU ID is called by a user space process, we can say, if it's enabled, we can use it. If it's capable, say, we weren't able to set it up, but your CPU is capable of it, sorry. And then if it's not capable, we say, hey, you can't use these instructions. Your CPU isn't capable. So this is how the CPU keeps track of that stuff. If FX save and FX restore are supported, set up FPU. This is floating point uh, unit. This is like floating point arithmetic. I think it was from x86. And basically, if it's enabled, you have to do this crazy FN init thing after setting up uh, these. Right? So cr0.em, if set, fpu and vector op operations will cause a UD. So we have to clear this bit. And then ts in cr0 is task switched. If set, all fpu and vector ops will cause a uh, non maskable, non maskable interrupt fault. I don't know. I don't even know. I don't know. <laughs> what is hash nm? I forget. In any case, you can't do it. It'll cause a problem. So we clear these bits, otherwise there's big issues. CR0, if you don't know, is the control register 0 of x86, and it basically has a bunch of flags that have to do with how the computer is operating and what's allowed. And after we enable it, then we say, okay, it's now enabled. We should probably do like tests or something, I don't know. FPU not supported, ensure it is disabled. So this ensures the opposite of this is true the opposite of what this does, which means that if they are attempted to be used, it'll say, hey, that's undefined behavior. Hey, this is not okay. Non-maskable. I don't even know what that stands for, as I said. Then, also, after setting up the FPU, or after trying, try and set up SSE. <sighs> SSE is like 128-bit uh, operations, I'm fairly certain. SSE2, at least, which is what this is. So if SSE is allowed, then we say, okay, we're, we are, we can do SSE. And then we have to set all these because if we provide a XM exception handler, if we provide FX save, FX restore functionality, and then coprocessor monitoring and emulation, coprocessor emulation basically makes a single core act like all of the cores. So even if I'm pretty sure so you can have the core zero act, emulate other cores. There's so much, there's so much to do. 
no, this isn't cores. This is coprocessors. So this is for like servers with two CPUs and stuff like that. And it's saying which one should handle things. Anyway, there's that SSE. There's also other than FX save, FX restore, there's X save and X save saves a bunch of registers that have to do with very large bit operations capable only through AVX, basically operated on only through AVX. So what we do is say, if we have X save, then we're capable. Enable X save, which means we have to set the bit OS provides. <laughs> uh, something's missing there, but I'm pretty sure this is OS provides a... Uh... <laughs> I love that it's just not there. OS provides the XM exception handler as before, but I could be wrong. Uh, we enable it. And then if SSE and XSave are supported, then we can set up AVX. I'm not sure if this is correct. I remember I couldn't find enough data on this. Like, can you have AVX without having SSE? Is that a possibility? I don't know. But uh, this is how it currently works. And then basically we enable AVX if we are uh, able to. And that is all of the CPU craziness. Isn't that insane? All of that just to figure out and set up like, oh, floating point operations and context switching commands. It's horrid. <laughs> we basically then create our CPU from our description of our CPU. And then we say, okay, system CPU has this CPU, bleh. Again, we're gonna have to do like NUMA domain stuff and that stuff here, but we'll get there, we'll get there. So at this point, where are we? CPU ID is supported. You can see CPU vendor ID is authentic AMD. So our QEMU, our emulator, is running an AMD CPU with these capabilities. We have no XSave or AVX, but we do have all the others. And uh, we were able to enable them. So that's good. Uh, and then you can see CPU 0000. What that actually refers to, is it here? Where is it? Do I have CPU? It is CPU. Uh, basically, that gets a CPU ID string. That's not what I want to do. Where is it? It's got to be somewhere here. Where's the CPU itself? So CPUs have a logical core number, a physical core number, a NUMA chip number, and a NUMA domain number, and an APIC ID for the local APIC. All of these identify the CPU based on chip, domain, physical core, and logical core. So you can figure out which actual processing unit you're talking to with all those numbers, which is why we save them in the CPU class. And this is where they're printed out. Craziness, right? And then we look for this thing called the memory mapped configuration space, the ACPI table. So ACPI is a standard that has basically a bunch of tables that can all have different data within them. And there's a whole bunch of different ones. And uh, so to find a table, you use the header and a signature and you basically say, looking for blah table if you're debugging. We say, how many entries are there? Okay, for every entry, iterate over each one and get the standard descriptor table. Basically, each table starts with the standard descriptor table. All of these are tables. This standard descriptor table header is at the beginning of each uh, time you iterate. And then you can just use this to determine what type of table it is, who made it, why it's there, how big it is, stuff like that. And one of them that we in particularly need is RSDB2. So what we do is, where are we? There we are. We ACPI initialize, which if we check this out, you can see it's right here. And we say from the root system descriptor pointer, remember our bootloader actually found that for us if you remember up here, and it saves that in the boot info, passing it to the kernel to be used here. 
And we use that to get our root system descriptor pointer and our extended system descriptor table, which is stored in the root system descriptor pointer table, right? <laughs> and then we basically uh, fill out these global variables with our RSDP and XSDT. So that's our initialization. Then we look for the MCFG and the MCFG stores PCI devices. So storage devices like AHCIs will be detected here, which is good. That means we can start to talk to hard drives. So with that, we use the, uh, what is it? Whoops. Enumerate PCI. Oh boy, this is a good one. Are you ready? So to enumerate the PCI, you basically look in your MCFG, which we found from find table and the ACPI. And this MCFG contains all the PCI devices and uh, they're stored in what's called device configs of ACPI. And uh, we basically get a device config address and then the device config itself just through a, a cast. And then we basically iterate over it from its start to its end and enumerate each bus within this device config. So a bus, a device config is basically a thing that can hold a bunch of devices and all it has is a list of buses and each of these buses may be used by numerous devices themselves. So for each bus, we enumerate the bus and we do some math to uh, keep track of where we are. I used to have to map it, but we no longer do because of identity mapping. Uh, we used to have to map and unmap it. Then you'd basically just loop over the bus for all of the devices, which there are 32 of in each bus, 32 possible devices. And here we do have to memory map it because uh, these are generally not in the proper place. Uh, like they're in some hardware mapped memory, which is generally has some crazy address that isn't actually within regular RAM, which is all we have mapped in the kernel. So we map it and then we say, okay, get the header there. If the header is invalid, like we should skip it, then unmap the same memory that we just mapped, which means we don't actually have to, uh, you know, we don't actually have to keep this mapped for no reason. We can free up some memory, which is always good. But if it does exist, then we enumerate all of its functions, which there are eight of. Isn't this insane? And then each device having eight functions, you uh, enumerate the function. And each function basically stores a PCI device header. So this is where you actually get to the functions that the PCI device uh, implements, if that makes any sense. And, uh, oh boy, oh boy. Basically, when we enumerate a function, we get an actual device. This function means, okay, we have a device. This is something we can use. And uh, you can see we have to do cache human readable information with device in device tree. That's a good idea, but currently we have get vendor name, get device name, get subclass name, and get progif name. And we can use those to get the actual PCI values. What these are, are actually telling you what they are. So if we go, <laughs> what do you know? If we look at PCI descriptors, you can see that there are different device classes, right? get device name, which is vendor ID and device ID. And all of these are different classes of devices. And then within each of these classes, there's actual specific hardware that each has their own, their own, you know, ID. This is such a horrible way to do things, but honestly, it's not bad. <laughs> but yeah, you can see there's a lot of hardware, you know, there's a lot. And uh, what we're most interested in most of the time is HCI, because what this means is that there are actually hard drives, SATA hard drives, talk through HCI controllers. So what we do is say, okay, if it's a mass storage controller, and if it's SATA, and if it's an HCI 1.0, well, hey, we know how to deal with that. We're saying, okay, create a 
a storage device uh, with the proper system numbers, system device identifying numbers, we know what it is. And then we basically say uh, we store the PCI device header in data two, and then we set flag that major storage search true. So what this means is that if it's major storage and this flag is set, we should search it for a file system. Does that make sense? So if for some reason we shouldn't search a major storage device for a file system, we can skip it here and set this to false or set it to false later for some other reason. And then we don't have to search it, which takes a lot of time. And then we add our device to our global system. This is like our, see, our hardware system, right? So now we have this storage device. Cool, huh? That's what enumerating PCI does. Again, there's a lot more to do there. You can handle graphics cards, you can handle net network cards, you can handle pretty much everything, and it'll, it's all through PCI. Ain't that fun? Then we probe for a storage devices. So all those storage devices that we just found, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna do some stuff to them. So we basically, I love this for each, by the way. We basically for each of the devices, if the device is a uh, major storage and a HCI controller, right? If it's a storage HCI controller and we should search it, this flag is not zero, then we can say, okay, we're probing this HCI controller. Blump, after we discovered all our devices. And then you can see that we... Uh, we do some complicated stuff here with the A bar. What this basically means is we're creating a place in, or not creating, we're using a place in memory that can be written to by the HCI controller, the actual hardware, that will overwrite this data. So we map that and then say, okay, using this data that we just got in the uh, first port, then what we're going to try and do is create a port controller to control the port and uh, basically do that. If it's a SATA device, then we want to make sure that we should search it further for partitions and file systems, stuff like this. Again, uh, we set this in multiple places, but it doesn't matter because this is important. Then we add the HCI port as its own device into the systems list. So each, the HCI controller itself is a device and so are each of its ports because uh, that's just how we have to make things work with inheritance and everything. And uh, we're saying basically, uh, where are we at? Why, why we set it to major storage search to false. Right, this is because we have already found all the ports. That would make sense. So if the dev flag storage search is not zero, we search it and then don't search it any further. Like don't search it again if we somehow happen to do that, right? Make sure it's zero on the device. Whereas the HCI port gets its search set to true. Find partitions. So this goes through each HCI port and looks for a GUID partition table, which is how file systems are stored. Also, buffer OXAA55, thank you so much for the follow. I totally missed it half an hour ago. My be, my be. Anyway, we loop over each of the devices again, and if it's an HCI port this time, right, not an HCI controller, a port of an HCI controller, what we do is, if we're supposed to search it, we get the port controller and the driver. So we create, not create, but we use the uh, portcon data one as our driver, which basically just means that we can use it to uh, read, write, and stuff like that. It's a virtual class. Uh, searching HCI port blah for a GPT, which I'm so sure we'll see next. Searching HCI port zero for a GPT. And then it says, if GPT, GPT is present. So that's in gpt.cpp. Here's, is, GP, <laughs> is GPT present? Buffer XA55 says, not a problem, dude. Thank you so much. I am glad you are enjoying and still here. 
And I appreciate the follow. We all do. It's kind of hard to tell between all the if def debugs, but basically all this does is say if we can actually uh, read 512 bytes from, from the port and it actually contains a valid header signature for GPT, then we can say, hey, it's valid and return true. And if that's true, we say GPT is present, which it was. And then we say, okay, here's our GPT header, which we create. Here's our sector, which we create a basically a byte array so that we can uh, store what we're reading as we go. And then we say read 512 bytes uh, from 512 bytes. So this skips the, uh, the boot sector. So if there's a bootloader on the hard drive, we skip it. We read the GPT header, and then we, uh, we get it into this address of the smart putter. And this smart putter basically just means that on destruction, it'll free its payload. So that's it. That just means we don't have to use delete down here. But yeah. We read 512 bytes and say, hey, iterate over each uh, partition table entry. And if we should ignore it, ignore it, right? Otherwise, if it's a null GUID, ignore it. Otherwise, if the end LBA is less than the start LBA, ignore it. There's not much to be said there. That doesn't make any sense. We don't allow for backwards file systems <laughs> or partitions. Sorade says smart pointers. <laughs> A. And you're saying you don't want a C++ standard lib. <laughs> this is very different from how C++ <laughs> smart pointers work. That's basically just a destructor that calls delete which is how a unique putter works, right? <laughs> oh. And you're saying you don't want a C++ standard lib. C++ standard lib is just gigantic and monstrous and confusing. It's, it's like <laughs> they solve problems that nobody has, and the problems that people have, they don't solve. <laughs> it's a killer. Uh, if we find a valid partition, we print out all the stuff about it, blah, right? And uh, we basically then say, okay, we found one. It's a GPT partition and it's this big. I think that's next actually. We create a partition driver. So we basically have a driver to handle all GUID partition tables or GUID partition AHCI ports, right? And then when we read and write from this, we can, et cetera, do things. And then we say GPT partition set flag search to true because we want to search all partitions possible. And you can see that we have a, a new system device, which is a GPT partition, which should be added to the system right here. But uh, we basically say don't touch partitions with any known GUIDs for now. So partitions with known GUIDs would, for example, be... Uh, like Microsoft NTFS file system. So we'll just ignore those. We're just going to say, yeah, we, we're not going to do that. So it says, okay, then here's the deal. I'll implement the stuff that you're already using, but I'll add lots of underscores and put it in a namespace called standard. <laughs> if you, uh, if you want to have your own fork of Lenser OS, you can do that there. <laughs> Little mouth. Sraid says, I'm fine with using Pascal case too, if that's what you prefer. Oh no. Again, there's literally no naming convention. That's the horrid part. I'm pretty sure functions are meant to be snake case. And like local variables are meant to be camel case. And then global variables are meant to be Pascal case with a G in front of them. A lowercase g. And then... I don't even know. I'm pretty sure class names are supposed to be Pascal case. Types are Pascal case from what I can tell. Yeah, type names. And then all caps for enumerators. There is a naming convention. It's just an interesting one. 
Oh. But yeah, basically, if it's a known GUID, we say, hey, don't do not do this thing. We don't need it. And uh, if we add it, that's perfect. We add it as a system device, our new partition. Else, we delete part driver because we created it and we don't need it for this partition. And then we say for our actual HCI port, set flag search to false, we've already searched it. Okay. Now, are you ready for where everything goes wrong? <laughs> we should have left it at uh, GPT, right? Getting the GPT partitions and parsing them and making system devices. We may have even should have left it at HCI ports. The kernel shouldn't really be, <laughs> shouldn't have file system drivers in it. However, this is Lenser OS. It's not a good kernel, it's mine. So there are file system drivers in the kernel. They're not going to be for user space. User space file system driver is still going to be in user space. But uh, for now, we have a file system driver in the kernel. That way we can actually run programs that are included. <laughs> Otherwise, we're kind of screwed, right? So we do need a file system driver in the kernel, at least one. The rest can be, who cares, right? All in user space and deal with that using uh, syscalls and stuff. Anyway, we then detect file systems on all of our partitions and stuff like that, or AHCI ports, or stuff like that. So we say, okay, if it's a sysdev major storage search and it's major storage, look, look in it. If it's a partition, look for a partition. Create a good partition driver, or use the good partition driver that was created. And then we can basically say add file system, which is this file system, if it passes the FAT test. <laughs> Else, if dev minor, sysdev minor, HCI port. So basically, if we have an HCI port that is still searchable, which means it did not have a good partition table on it, what we go ahead and do is say look for a file system on that, which we only know about FAT for now, but we could add any amount of file systems, as you can imagine. Just add a new test to each one of these. And uh, not too hard. But yeah, so we add our file systems if we find them. And then we say virtual file system print debug. And that's where this happens. VFS, debug info, no mounts, no open files. How about that? We then go through and say mount all of our virtual, all of our file systems, our non-virtual file systems. Actually go ahead and mount those. Right? And basically we say slash fs with a number after it, right? So this will be slash fs0, fs1, fs2, blah, blah, blah. And then we mount those as paths into our virtual file system. Just like Linux, but not in the mount directory, right? That's it. By the way, I know what the problem is with your volatile read in friends is you're casting away the volatile and calling mem copy. Yes. Do we need a volatile mem copy? How does that work then? Also, I'm pretty sure we're not calling mem copy. You can remove it and test, but I'm pretty sure we're copying things that are, we're reading and writing one, two, four, or eight bytes. So these are happening. So right says yes. But yeah, I don't think the mem copy is being called. That would definitely be an issue though, you're right, because then it's not volatile. I don't know. I've got nothing for you. The pointers on the right-hand side are not volatile either. That's also a problem. Well, you can make that be a problem. How, how is that a problem? You can't write to a volatile pointer from a non-volatile pointer. How would you ever write to a volatile pointer? How would you ever create one? How would you ever initialize it? This doesn't make any sense. I don't think that's correct. I'm pretty sure you can, you can do this. Because this is just a U64. This is a volatile U64 which means that hardware may change it at any time. But when we read it, oh, in this case, it's not a problem. 
That's what I was thinking. When we're reading, it shouldn't be a problem either. We read this volatile pointer and copy it into a non-volatile pointer. In volatile read, both are volatile and you're casting it. So if out wasn't volatile, is that what we're saying? Either one of the pointers doesn't need to be volatile or something is wrong. I would guess that out doesn't need to be volatile. You can check in the HPET how we use it. Here's how it's used. <laughs> oh boy. So we're passing it and ret, which is definitely not a volatile pointer. And it's size four. I think we also have read byte. These are just read long. I don't even know. Pointer arithmetic is hard. Never cast away volatile that defeats the whole purpose of it. Again, I wrote this like six months ago, trying to write an HPET driver. <laughs> I didn't know what I was doing. If you're reading from a memory mapped address, that address needs to be volatile. Exactly, that's what this is. This doesn't know. If you're writing to a memory mapped address, that address needs to be volatile. Yep, volatile, volatile. We're good. We are good. Which means that we can eventually take off if def v box, <laughs> right? Uh, anyways, where were, where were we? The VFS. Uh, after setting up the VFS, we go on to do some other stuff. We initialize the pit timer with a, a frequency of like 20 or something, or a thousand. I don't even remember. 20 hertz. We basically tell it to count for us. 20 times a second, let us know that it happens. And this lets us know like, okay, this is 1 20th of a second has gone by. 1 20th of a second has gone by, blah, blah, blah. And that's how this timer in the top right functions. The pit elapsed. That's where that comes from. This pit timer right here, counting 20 times a second. Then we initialize the TSS, the task state segment, which is used for switches between privilege levels. So like from kernel to user space, AKA ring zero to ring three. So it says basically the address that can change without the compiler knowing it must be volatile. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. If hardware writes to it, it needs to be volatile. TSS initialize and then scheduler initialize. So this scheduler is a whole thing. <laughs> In case you didn't know. Scheduling, uh oh, hello? I'm pretty sure that Emacs just, oh, nope, we're fine. Okay, we're good. Anyway, <laughs> it's like Emacs just crashed. The scheduler is basically a group, it's a namespace, it's a group of things that uh, handle multitasking. Ain't that fun, right? And uh, what this means is that you can add processes and remove processes based on PIDs. And this will actually uh, switch between them eventually. So to initialize, we call timer tick equals pit tick, which basically says this is a function pointer. I know it's not clear, really. Timer tick is a function pointer. So this could be HPET tick if we set up the HPET instead and want to use that as our main system timer. Whatever we want to use, we set it here. And uh, there's multiple reasons why that's needed. IRQ handler in assembly switches processes using this function. So to switch a process, we use scheduler switch, which is a function written just down below. That's switch process. Scheduler switch, no? I don't know. It's somewhere. Uh, oh yeah, scheduler switch is the scheduler switch process. So wherever, again, it's not here. 
<laughs> here it is. Okay. So here's the scheduler switch process, which is just a function pointer. External symbol for scheduler.asm. There you go. Yeah, there it is. And it's missing things too. So this is our IRQ0 handler. So basically, whenever our timer ticks, right, we're meant to call this handler now. Does that make sense? So our timer tick is set because every time it happens, we would like to say, hey, install a handler at IRQ0 to call this IRQ0 handler. And then we call timer tick. Does that make sense? Hopefully that makes sense. Uh, in any case, I rec Q arguments already on the stack. We have some arguments from uh, an I rec Q. But basically, we swap GS if we need to. Don't worry about that. We push all of our registers. We increment our timer tick count. We call a C++ function, argument in an RDI, which is scheduler switch process. We end the interrupt by sending this byte out through the bus. Serade says, NASM, pog, <laughs> yeah. That's true. I'm pretty sure everything in Lenser OS is written in NASM except for libc. Because writing libc in NASM is horrid. Serade says, no more percentages. Yee, yee, yee. And then we restore the CPU state from the stack, this thing here. And we eat RSP off the stack because we're doing a bunch of pushes and pops. How about that, hmm? How about that? And that's a context switch. And in scheduler switch process, you can see that we copy the current CPU state into uh, the CPU state. Right, we copy the given CPU state on the stack, right, which is basically this. We copy that into this current process specific CPU state. Then we say if the current process is null, then go back around to the beginning. Otherwise, current process equals next viable process, which could be anything. And, uh, you know, again, this comment is incorrect, but don't worry about it. Uh, otherwise, current process equals next viable process. This next viable process just looks for a process that uh, we can run. Eventually, it'll be more complicated and have to do with, like, C CPU times and stuff like that. It doesn't matter. This is fine for now. Uh, anyways... That's what it does when it tries to switch processes. It sets current process. So now current process is new. So we copy the current uh, process CPU because we just switched it, right? So the new process CPU, copy that into the CPU state on the stack, which will again, overwrite all of these, which means all of these will then be changed by the, when we return. So copy the CPU onto the stack flush the page map for this new process. So each process gets its own virtual page map. And that's what this is doing here. It's switching that. Update ES and DS to SS. That's a complicated way to say there are these registers that have to do with what privilege level you're in. So you have to make sure that they correspond to the proper things. And we just set them to zero because because things. And same with FS and GS. Technically, we could use these for whatever. These are technically just for the OS, but we just set them to something so that it's not uh, confusing. How about that? How about that? That's the scheduler. We initialize that. Hey, look. And then we set up the standard out file. This is very, very rudimentary. Yeah, you'd think. So in our VFS, we basically say, okay, create a debug out driver, which is just a driver. Where is that implemented? I don't even know. Is it really in uh, storage device drivers? Yeah, debug out. But you can see that the debug out driver basically just writes a buffer 
into uh, the UART output, debug message output. And reading, you can't read. We don't support that. It doesn't matter. Reading from standard out, uh, <laughs> whoever needed to do that, right? No, but uh, this is just, again, very rudimentary and temporary. We create standard out here by creating a new file metadata, which is a, a debug out metadata thing, so that this file, we know how to actually access it. And then we can add this file to the VFS. So this file doesn't actually need to be in any uh, path. It's just standard out. Does that make any sense? So we're basically creating a standard out file that just writes to the debug out by default. It's really not complicated. It's just specific handling so that we can actually see output from programs. Anyway, if there's more than zero file systems, then we say, okay, file path equals fs0 blaze it. <laughs> and it says opening blah with VFS, and it tries to do it got file descriptor blah, right? So let's see what this does. Also, here's the TSS and scheduler initialization. Not really important. Flushed IDT after installing new IRQ0 handler. That's perfect. VFS debug info. You can now see that we have a mount with the path FS0, and it is a file allocation table file system, a FAT file system, with a driver and a storage device driver. How about that? How about that? Open files. There is an open file with byte offset zero. At the very beginning of the file system, there is a file. And it is blaze it. So we tried to open blaze it, right? Did we? No, we didn't yet. This is standard out. That's right. That makes more sense. So this is standard out, which is a always open file in the kernel for now. Then we get to here, open fs0 blaze it with vfs, got file descriptor one. That's our first file descriptor. Then we debug again, and you can see that we have an open file one with a storage device driver that matches the file system and a byte offset, which makes sense. 800,000 bytes into the file system is a file. How about that? Reading the first few bytes, which is what we do here, right? We read 11 bytes from the start. I don't know why we, it's 11, but it's 11. We read 11 bytes from the start of the file. And if it matches, uh, yeah, we basically just print that out, which is what this is. It's an ELF file, which you can see. And then we basically say, if it does not equal negative one, then try and create an ELF user space 64 process from it. And uh, this is the ELF loader. And it basically is just a very simple implementation to load ELF programs and execute them. There's a whole lot to do, but basically we get the headers from the beginning of the file. We copy the current page table by forking. And then we make sure that the proper things uh, happen. So you see we clone the active page map. We map the new page table into itself so that the new page table can access itself, which is important, as it turns out, before you switch to it. Otherwise, you can never switch out. We set up the stack flags, which uh, we basically just set all of them, I'm pretty sure. No, we don't set it as executable, which uh, I think we use GNU stack for that. In any case, Load PT load program headers, mapping to virtual address as necessary. That's what that does. So you can see we attempt to map virtual blur to physical blur and page table at blur. And what that allows is for this program header, the program can access it at this address. The physical RAM it's actually stored in is at this address. And then the page table it's used in, which means where this mapping takes place, is here which is specifically the page table for this new process, if you take a look. Somewhere here. Where is it? CR3, yeah. So you can see 749000, 749000. Anyway, we map 
And then we say, okay, what are our flags mapped? We did it, by the way. Our flags are present, non-writable, user accessible, and none of these, which is pretty important. And then we map the second program header. Much like our kernel up at the beginning, if you remember, we had two program headers. We have the same thing in these user space programs that have been compiled. These user space programs are uh, each have two headers. So there's our two headers. And uh, then this one, as you can see, is writable. So this is probably data, and this is code. And then we added the process to the scheduler. That's it. And then the scheduler has two processes. This is the kernel process, and this is the user space process. You can tell because user space processes have a, a, a stack segment which ends in three because they're in ring three. Uh, kernel processes have a stack segment that ends in zero because they're in ring zero. Ain't that fun? And then that, we successfully created a new process from Blazit. So that brings us all the way back to here. And then we close the file descriptor and we, uh, we print debug. So we close the file descriptor one and then we print this info and you can see that it closed the proper thing. The file's no longer opened. Now we open standard out, another file that we try and open and we say, try and open this executable. And we just do the same thing as above. So we didn't really make it as complicated. And uh, if it works, it works. And then we just close it and get out of there. No more debug output. We just go, yep, it worked. You can see that this one has three program headers. It's a little more complicated. Two for data and, or two for code. I don't know. No, this is read only data, code, and uh, data, BSS section. So it says const expert pog, <laughs> although it is here. <laughs> I don't think I even know, know what it means. I think I just put it in there and like, does it still work if I do this? Cause look, there's one right up here and it doesn't have it. I'm just like, yeah, I don't know. Fucking who knows? <laughs> here, we'll do it. Boom. Now they're both const expert. Should be static const expert, but still. Why? Why is this C sharp all of a sudden? When did C become C sharp? Look at these keywords. This is horrible. <laughs> oh, Lord. Anyways, this is when we initialize the hpet, which, uh, if you, again, change config.cmake, anything but vbox will have the hpet work, but vbox, vbox means na na na. hpet will not work just because it crashes the entire system trying to do anything with it. And uh, I'd rather have it work on VirtualBox and not have some obscure high precision event timer and just use the RTC with it instead. Totally fine. Less crashes, more important. Sarade so says C++ has been keyword soup for a while now. Const expert doesn't guarantee that it's initialized at compile time. You need static const expert for that. And on file scope, you need to use inline const expert instead. What does that mean? So like if I was making something at the highest level in the file, uh, Christ, not this one. If I was making something like here, I couldn't just use const expert. I'd have to do inline line where does it go or are you talking about like functions <laughs> i don't even know can you do const expert functions that'd be dope nope variables okay so like that was correct why is it giving me a warning inline variables are a c plus plus 17 extension so it's just warning me that this is c17 you know Crazy. Yeah, that's obvious. <laughs> Weird. Anyway. 
after we uh, do this user space program loading and initialize the HPET, initialize the PS2 mouse, we enable IRQ interrupts that will be used, which are the system timer, the keyboard, the cascaded pick, which is the uh, interrupts 8 through 15. If you have any more questions about const expert, I'll delegate you to like half a dozen Jason Turner videos. Just go to C Weekly YouTube channel and search for const expert. Thank you. Bless. Sraid says, of course you can do const expert functions. You can do arbitrary calculations at compile time. Oh god. But yeah, so we enable all these interrupts, like the real-time clock, the PS2 mouse interrupts, the UART COM1. So if someone's trying to talk to us, we're like, yep, we need that. And uh stuff like that. Then, you can see that we have different ways to print out our memory, but we print out our EFI memory map summed, and that's what all this blue is. You can see we successfully created standard out process, HPET, buggy on virtual box, mouse initialized perfectly using serial port ID 0. Here is our EFI memory map, so you can see that uh, this is summed, but it, it gives us a bunch of regions, right? And each of these regions has a type. So reserved memory is stuff that is stuff reserved for UEFI. No matter what, I should never touch these memory regions. And these are 256 me uh, megabytes in total, right? Not maybe bytes, megabytes. And uh, so this means 256 megabytes of RAM will just always be used. There's nothing I can do about it. And uh, then you can see that we have some more stuff like runtime services, code, and data, which uh, if you're not planning on returning to UEFI, you can just fucking yeet these. Who cares? Boot services, code, and data, definitely don't touch these, right? Loader data and loader code, that's the bootloader. So who cares? Do whatever you want to it. Conventional memory is the actual usable memory. So conventional memory... That's actually free. That is what the uh, what the hardware is giving us and saying, use it however you want. So it says, this is the channel in question, posts a link. If you're interested in C++, I recommend you check it out. He does a video about random C++ topic every week, and he's been doing that for like five years now or something, and he really likes const expert, Lamel. <laughs> yeah, there's some ACPI memory for the tables. There's some memory mapped IO, etc. Blah, blah, blah. That's all our memory map. Here's our heap at the end of initialization. You can see it's not too bad. We have a, a few gaps in there, but really, it's mostly non-segmented. We could probably clean it up. There's eight bytes here, right, that we don't need. 16, 11, 291, 168. It's really not that bad. It is really not that bad at all. Alrighty, uh, but yeah, so you can see heap metadata versus payload ratio in used regions. Lower is better, 43%. So this means that 43% of our heap that is in use is actually just uh, being taken up by the headers, the actual data that the heap requires to keep track of everything. So the, the smaller this gets, the more efficient all of this is, if that makes sense. Interesting. Very interesting. Pretty sure this is wrong. Kernel memory compacting phase when? I mean, it would be right here, right at the end of case stage one. <laughs> It'd be here. Compact memory here. But yeah, that's definitely something we can do to make things more efficient. It's not too bad, though, as far as heap implementations go. And uh, you can see our memory manager debug info. So total memory, 357. Used memory, 305 megabytes. And free memory, 52 megabytes. And of this 305, remember that 256 of it is reserved by EFI. So that's not me. Boot services, data, and code. That's another 30 megabytes, right? So then we're up to 290. 
and then all of these, so 295. So 295 of these megabytes aren't mine, which tracks because there's 52 megabytes free. We started with 61. So there's about 10 megabytes of usage that the OS uses. So the OS runs on 10 megabytes of RAM. How about that? Hmm? How about that? There's only like, uh, I think, 128 megabytes of RAM given to QEMU. Should we look at the bat? What is it? There's 100 megabytes. <laughs> look at that. 100 megabytes of memory given to QEMU. And we have no problems. That's something I'm very proud of. Our low memory usage is pretty dope. Uh, so yeah. I mean, I know it's not low, low. It's not kilobytes, but goddamn. You know. Imagine a computer with 128 megabytes of RAM. It could run this OS. We, uh, again, print out our CPU, our system devices. Here you can see how our number system works. These are uh, HCI ports. This is an HCI controller. And this is our GPT partition. And then our file system, which, of course, has a first eight bytes of uxum2. Uxum24, which you'll you'll recognize if you know file allocation table <laughs> uh, format, if you've looked at it in hex dump ever. But yeah, so basically after that, we uh, just print out our debug info as much as possible. Print out all the debug info possible. Blah, blah, blah. And here is where it gets crazy. Allow interrupts to trigger. Oh boy, this is so much. This is when everything we just set up, this whole function, this is when it really comes into play. All of these interrupts that we have enabled are now gonna be running, which means that our handlers in interrupts, right? All of our handlers will be running. So all of these will be running based on every time these interrupts happen. So the system timer, remember the scheduler actually updated that to IRQ zero handler. So this will run every this will run 20 times a second as soon as we call this STI. As soon as this happens, boom, interrupts are enabled. We are switching contexts 20 times a second. Sarade says 52 megabytes. That means you can run the OS entirely from within the CPU cache. Well, 52 megabytes is actually the free memory. That's actually how much we have free. Used, we have 10 megabytes because we started with 61 megabytes of usable memory, 63,000 kilobytes. And we whittled it down to 52, which means we use nine megabytes, nine to 10 megabytes for our OS. So it says, ah, well, even better. <laughs> but yeah, you're right. Our entire OS is probably in the CPU cache. Pretty dope. <laughs> I think that's pretty dope. But, Look what happens when we enable interrupts. Hello, friends. Where does that come from? It's not here. You see, it says interrupts enabled. Where's interrupts enabled? Oh, wait, it's down here. How could that happen? How could this and this not run atomically? Because we get a system timer and we switch to another one of our tasks, which is hello, friends. What is that? Well, if you go to user and go to standard out and go to main.c, you'll notice something maybe. Hmm, that looks like hello friends, doesn't it? And this is using a standard library to write to a file, the standard out file, a message of, sh of length, string length. How about that? So this C program, it can be C++, it doesn't matter. This C program is actually running from Lenser OS. Hello, friends. It's printing to standard out, which if you remember, we made standard out a file that prints to the debug out, which is here, which is here. Isn't that just so awesome? That, that took me six months to do. <laughs> I'm not even joking. Sarade says, you can print to standard out? Nice. I know, it's like, that took me so long. 
But when I did that, I was like, I actually did it. <laughs> I was like, I just, I stopped programming on the OS. I was like, I, I finished. Sir Aid says that's like 95% of all of programming already implemented, right? It's all, it's, the system is there. The system is there. <laughs> but yeah, it actually says hello friends from main.c in this user space program. And guess what? This program was compiled with the compiler we compiled. <laughs> this program is compiled with Lenser GCC, and is what I'm saying. Whoops. Also, I forgot I did that. <laughs> I don't know if you'll be able to see this, but uh, I'm actually able to, here, just do this. You ready? When you type in the terminal, see I'm clicking over here. This is where I have selected. Isn't that cool? When I did that, I thought it was very cool. You can type from the terminal and uh, <laughs> there's no arrow keys, but you can type. <laughs> I thought that was so much fun. But yeah, you can see hello friends and then exiting. Exiting? What is that? You may wonder. That is a proof that everything is working together. libc in, oh god, what is it? Is it unist? Where's exit? Does anybody know where exit is? Here it is. Yeah, it's here. It's in unist. Retina1337 says, you made a key logger. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> a key logger that you can draw in. <laughs> Ooh, how about that? Hmm? <laughs> I love the idea that I made an entire OS just to be able to <laughs> type into it. <laughs> it is funny to me. Here, we're going to erase. I think this is ugly. Yeet. 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 It's always fun to like scrub back and forth with space and backspace. <laughs> oh no. I pressed enter. I didn't mean to do that. Yeet. <laughs> Lamau. Erasing with backspace, Lamau. <laughs> I don't know how else to do it, to be honest. Do a barrel roll. But yeah, this is the OS. It's been it's stable, as you can see. The uh the time. It's been going for like over ten minutes now. Eleven minutes. Is that even longer than that? I don't even know. Has it been going an hour? 6,000 seconds an hour? Am I dumb? 3,600 seconds would be... Oh, God. This has been open a while, has it not? Am I am I just being dumb? I can't do math right now. It's been too long. But yeah, here is our exit. But you'll notice that in main.c, we don't call exit. We call return zero from main. So returning zero... 3,600 seconds is an hour. That's what I was thinking. That's what I was thinking. So this has been open for like two hours. Nearly. In 10 minutes, it'll have been open for two hours. Well, there you go. It's stable as fuck. Retina says you created the reverse of an Etch-a-Sketch. <laughs> Basically. But it would run on your computer. Like you could just boot into this OS easily on any modern machine. I mean, any x86-64 modern machine. But are there modern machines that aren't x86-64? I don't think anybody actually has them. Other than universities that are creating them. That's awesome, though. Good runtime. Good runtime. <laughs> I always love uh, <laughs> drawing over it. Because it updates like 20 times a second. <laughs> I have too much fun from nothing. Anyway... Where do, how to, why is exiting called? We don't call exit here. And the answer is that this is libc. 
the main function is actually within a whole a whole string of things. The start function. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? So you create a linked list null entry in the stack frame for uh, exception handling or stack walking or whatever. Backtracing, that's what it is. We store argc and argv on the stack uh, just so we don't lose track of them. Then we run the global constructors, which is in underscore init. This is here. It's a little complicated because in dot init, GCC will put the dot init section of CRT begin dot O here. And this is supposed to be CRT end dot O. GCC has some automatic stuff to help you with building your own libc, basically, is what I'm trying to say. And uh, that's what this is. <laughs> this will run your global constructors for the entire program, which is nice, very nice. Uh, but yeah. Then we get back argc and argv into our proper things for our main call, because we're using the elf system5 ABI. And then we call exit with return status from main as argument. So we move racks into RDI and call exit. But you'll notice we exit. Exiting. And then sys$, this is a sys call. So you'll notice that in unistata, we say sys call exit status while one. How about that? <laughs> Explain that one. The answer is that this exit syscall is meant to remove this process from execution. So if exit syscall returns, that means that somehow we, we didn't exit. We failed to exit. And if that happens, we just say, okay, wait forever. <laughs> I don't know what to do, right? You can't have a program destroy itself. That'd be like the Incredibles right can't have that but yeah so we call syscall exit and uh, this syscall which is what sys dollar means then we haven't even talked about syscalls uh in interrupts there are there are maskable interrupts like hardware interrupts irqs interrupt requests but there's also syscalls which are user user interrupts and basically we have these uh, syscalls, which start with sys dollar and then a number, which is what syscall they are. And they basically just uh, interact with the kernel versus uh, user space. So this code will actually run in ring zero. So anything in a syscall must have like the utmost validation which we do not at the moment. This is the very beginnings of syscalls. There's literally four. No, there's there's six, and one of them is poke. <laughs> Sir Aid says, Serenity OS naming conventions, I see. For syscalls, yeah. I didn't know you could use dollar. So I was like, when I figured out you could use dollar, I was like, okay, that does look cool. Sys dollar is like, that's a syscall, baby. I like it. I like how it looks. It's purely aesthetic. It's purely aesthetic. Okay. But yeah, as you can see, we have like open, so we can open a path, a file path, and we just call open in our virtual file system. Not really complicated. Same with close. Read, same, write, same. Turns out the VFS handles all of the file handling. What do you know? Sarade says, just dollar is a legal variable name in C and C++. That's crazy. Dollar equals one million. <laughs> How to make C look like Pearl. Oh, that's a good idea. Have a naming convention. Where... <laughs> oh, I don't know why I like that so much. Have a naming convention where every single variable starts with a dollar sign. This is this is Pearl. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> We're doing driver, debug out. Look, it even breaks syntax highlighting. <laughs> it's real angry. <laughs> oh, that's such a cursed idea. I love it. I like using just dollar as a loop variable. 
Oh, that is nice. That would be nice. So when we do four each, we could use dollar. It's so weird. I've I've never seen code like that. <laughs> use dollar for vars and no dollar for types, Lamau. Dollar string string. Isn't that backwards? <laughs> Yeah, we'll change it to dollar u64 dollar number <laughs> equals. <laughs> Sorry, it's just goddamn it. <laughs> string string. That's right. That honestly isn't too bad. <laughs> like we're joking about it, but it actually looks kind of nice. That fixes the namespace issue, lol. Definitely. I don't think we'll ever have a namespace issue in the kernel. <laughs> Oh, that would be funny though. That would be funny. But yeah, as you can see, exit, we basically say systolar exit, removed process, PID. What we should do is say like what number this is, which is status. How do I do an int? I think it's dash I. Yeah. Sarade says, I have this problem all the time. I'll, I'll have a variable called state and an enum that I also want to call state, but I can't. That's actually, I know exactly what you mean. That happens so often. Or like when dealing with addresses, address, address equals address. <laughs> Stuff like that. I definitely get that. So now you could do address dollar address. Mm. <clears throat> So I just end up calling the enum st instead. That's a bad solution. <laughs> a bad solution. <laughs> uh, I can't imagine seeing st state. I would I would cry. There we go. That's, yeah, that's <laughs> st state equals st start or something like that. Yes. <laughs> because of course it's an enum struct. Why wouldn't it be? Is that an actual thing? Are you curious? Are you, are you, are you curious? Are you serious? Enum struct? I've never heard of that. Can you actually? Oh no. <laughs> oh no. Oh no, Saray just says yes. <laughs> Fuck. What is an enum struct? How does this work? <laughs> then can I just int a equals one? Like, how does this work? <laughs> like, is that. So if you have enum struct foo x, enum struct or enum class declares a scoped enum. You have to write foo x to access c. Okay, so you can't have members still, but you'd have to write a a b c d instead of just having a b c d like in c if you just write an enum. Okay, that makes sense. That makes sense. I don't know why they would use this this terminology. That's confusing. <laughs> they could have just called it like. Uh, strict enum. That's a hard one, right? I don't know. It's like they're scared to introduce new keywords and they keep reusing the same ones. <laughs> but yeah, as you can see, we set up this array with all of our syscalls. And then in our syscall handler, when we call this interrupt, we basically just say, okay, if it's a valid syscall, save the state, do your thing, call the proper syscall, right? Also this NASM syntax, oh my. Uh, but yeah, we basically add, we add the syscall number to the syscall uh, array address. There's 
definitely a better way to do this. The reason why they reuse keywords is because introducing a new keyword might break things, Lamau. That's also the only reason why we throw exceptions. The original term is to raise an exception. Crazy. What is throw used for before exceptions? What? Okay, now I'm confused. But yeah, so this is how we uh, enter and exit a syscall. And you can see that this runs in the kernel. So this is in kernel mode, ring zero, which means our syscalls run in ring zero, which means that we have the privilege to access things like the VFS and the scheduler. And then you can see we were able to run a program, exit from it, all in the time that it took 1 20th of a second, less than 1 20th of a second, right? Because then we switched back to the original process, process zero, and we ended up continuing where we were at the very bottom and we get back here. So after calling STI, we immediately switch, boom, new process running. Hello friends, exiting. Blaze it is also in here which was our first user space process. It just returns with a, with a very specific number, <laughs> a very specific number. Uh, but yeah, that's that. Sorade says, the image here is that of raising a physical exception line from low to high. Yes. But when they introduced exceptions to C++, they found out they couldn't make raise a keyword because lots of people were using that as an identifier and they didn't want to break everyone's code. So they went, I mean, when they say break everyone's code, is it really that hard to do a search and replace on the word raise? Just saying. Anyway, so they went, what's a word that no one's using for anything? And that sort of means something similar to raise. And they settled on throw. Crazy. Very crazy. But yeah, so we run blaze it and we, uh, we run all sorts of things, hopefully. And then uh, that's it. We, we're entered, we're here. That's all, that's all that'd be going on. That's crazy that they settled on throw. That's weird. No one's programming throw pillows. But yeah, after we return from K stage one, we are just in K main. And this is when we say, you've now booted into Lenser OS. And then we have to, according to the GPL v3, there's a license requirement that interactive terminals must print the copyright notice. This is an interactive terminal since we can type here and it shows up here, ASDF. So this is also technically an interactive terminal here, right? So we, we print that here as well. This is just for GPL v3, uh, but yeah, that's done here. And you can see that it is quite easy to draw a, a, a string to the screen. You just give it a draw position in the string and a color. And then that's it. It's pretty easy. Sorade says that's also why equals default and equals delete work the way they do. Crazy. So yeah, C++ likes reusing keywords. Rip. Makes it very confusing. Here's where we print do a barrel roll. Little, little that there happens right here. And then <laughs> if you, uh, if you remember the startup music, <laughs> hand coded startup music, baby. Also, this is now over two hours of runtime. This is probably the longest test I've ever done. Yeet. We're going to restart it just so you can hear the startup music. I'm loving it. And uh, that's our startup music. <laughs> it's the Mackie's theme, in case you didn't know. Uh, and then we basically start keyboard input at draw position, not origin. This means that when we type, you can see that we type here instead of typing over stuff up here. Stuff like that. And then we basically just enter this loop, this while true loop. We never break from it. And we just continually print and swap the uh, the thing in the top right of the screen. That's it. So, 
hey, that one went faster. All we do is actually refresh this constantly. And that's it. Everything else is handled by interrupts. So you can do all of it at the same time. Isn't that beautiful? There's my little multitasking OS, hobby OS that I made. Lenser OS. I like it. I like it a lot. It's not good by any means. It's not correct by any means. There should be like a wait here. We should wait and only update this once a second, right? But it doesn't matter. It truthfully does not matter. Because it works. Kernels are just giant event loops. OS is run on JavaScript, confirmed. Fuck. <laughs> I can't even imagine what it would take to run JavaScript. It's like, it breaks my brain how Serenity OS is so far so mature. Like running, even running a program that writes to standard out is like, that took me six months of just straight work. Like if you look at my GitHub, let's do it. Let's go look. We're gonna go look. If you literally go to my uh, GitHub, all of this time here, this is all OS. All of it, everything up until May, from October to May. This is just OS. 50 contributions on one day. 39, 28, 24, 32, 46, 35, 38, 46, 101. 101 commits. See, and that's just Lenser OS and Ratty. Do you understand? Thread says it only takes half as long to compile as LLVM. Lamau. <laughs> Serade says just compile V8 for your OS, full. That's right. I mean, technically, any statically linked program we should be able to handle. <laughs> Not that we will, but we should. And then it just comes down to supporting the proper syscalls and stuff like that. But yeah, as you can tell, I worked on Lenser OS for a long time. 38 commits, 20 commits in one repository. Open their first pull request for Lenser OS gas syntax support. Ooh, no, that's for Korth. <laughs> Lamau. I remember Korth. Then I drank my first beer. There's EV2, Lenser OS. There we go. Lots of Lenser OS. Basically just Lenser OS. Did I have something in Oh My Posh that got merged? Did I just see that correctly? Where was that? <laughs> Where was I just at? I don't know, it's gone now. I wrote an entire markdown to tech thing in <laughs> in Python. I forgot about that, man. I completely forgot about that. I've made a lot of things I totally forgot about. <laughs> but yeah, you can see the OS. I worked on it. I worked on the text editor. I worked on the compiler. And then I worked on CNote. <laughs> you can see it progress perfectly. Sir Aid says, oh god, you wrote a Markdown parser. Markdown may be the worst, the worst thing to parse in the world. But you can see I started with MDP. And then I was like, hmm, this sucks as well. I like writing parsers, but even so, I wouldn't touch Markdown with a 10-foot pole. Yeah, you're correct. Have you looked at it? <laughs> it's horrid. It's horrid. <laughs> the, just the white space. Sorry, it says, oh, I have. Yeah, it's it's horrid. Let's look up common mark. And uh, be scared. You know, be scared. So here's the spec. Here's where you should go, right? Yeah, just a simple spec, right? Simple. This is the hardest part, <laughs> the white space. Four spaces of indentation is too many. 
three spaces are allowed. <laughs> like what? Sarade says, I wrote a plugin for our Minecraft server that handles Markdown. I eventually settled on using 10 lines of replace all calls and regex. Let me see if I can find that code, lol. Oh lord. But yeah, the horrible part comes from this uh, three, not four spaces thing. Because indentation is also allowed. So it, it gets very confusing. For example, nested lists and precedence. There's, there's just so much. There's so much. Uh, yeah. You're also supposed to support HTML entities. We don't. <laughs> because turns out you can just paste the HTML entity into HTML and it works. Oh, how about that? <laughs> Oof. That's scary. But yeah, there's just so much. There's so much. Backslash escapes can eat, eat dirt. I hate backslash escapes with a passion. I can never code them correctly. It's hilarious. It seems so simple, but it's not. <laughs> oh, so bad. Lots to do. Lots to do. But yeah, that's, uh, that's it. I think I did it. I did everything I can think of, at least. Anybody have any questions? Any more questions? I'll answer them. I'll answer them vehemently. <sighs> Undefined reference to volatile read. Okay. There we go. What happened? What? Where's my shell? There it is. How to parse Markdown. Oh no. <laughs> oh my. <laughs> This is terrifying. <laughs> oh. That's really good. It would work. You're correct. It would absolutely work. And then you just replace Splash of 3 with... <laughs> oh, that's so good. I love this replacement, by the way. This is my favorite. Sarade says, it does work. Oh, I believe you. It, it should. It's not... A, <laughs> it wouldn't handle code, would it? Bold. List. Something. Something. Stars and underscores. This is a... This is very complicated. <laughs> But it's so simple. I really like it. Is this, what is this written in, by the way? Is this C++? What is this? I know this is VS Code, I'm pretty sure, based on this. No, that's C Lion. That's C Lion. That's what it... Looks like something I'd confidently copy-paste from Stack Overflow, because it's so weird it has to work. <laughs> this is in Java, in case you can't tell. Oh. <laughs> it's IntelliJ. Oh, no. Oh no, it's Java. <laughs> Why? No, I know it's Minecraft. Debug test command. Test foobar this text is obfuscated. Strike through. Nice. <laughs> obfuscated text? Is that a thing in common mark? That's not common mark, is it? I was just about to say, are you working in the language you complain about daily? <laughs> Sarade so says, it's a Minecraft plugin, that's why it's Java, lol. <laughs> but it's a thing in Minecraft, lol. Okay, that makes sense. 
Very cool. Where'd the stars go? Oh, it's bold from here to here. Oh my. <laughs> okay, we ran this again. Let's make sure everything still works. Hey. And uh, we could even, I can show you what it's like to, uh, dash d machine equals qemo that's what we're running oh boy <laughs> no matching function for call the map void pointer void pointer we need flags yeah mm-hmm uh -huh. So it's saying this doesn't work in HPET. This one right here. So we need flags. What do we want to flag this as? What are we mapping? So when we initialize the HPET, I don't even fucking know, dog. What is it called? <laughs> uh, let's go to case stage one and find memory map, man. Memory page table flag. There it is. Okay. There we go. So we would like this to be accessible, first of all, Mark it as present. That's probably an important one. And sure, we're going to need to or this with read write. Because do we ever write to this header address address? We, it looks like we do. So, I don't even know, dog. I don't even know. Uh, so, present, read, write. Uh, what else is there? Access, cache disabled, dirty, global, larger pages, not executable, present, Read, write, user super. This is fine. I think. You gonna be happy? What? Memory, no such, no match for operator or. Memory page table flag and memory page table flag. Do I have to, oh man, I have to. Yeah, cast to a U64. This is where I should be using a U size, by the way. Well, it built. We'll see if the HPET works. It always did on H on uh, Kiwi Move, so. Well, it's not entirely broken. It's very incorrect. <laughs> That's not, uh, these are not the same. <laughs> not too bad, though. Not too bad, though. Uh, yeah, there you go. There's the HPET working. We need to get it working on QEMU, uh, on not just QEMU, though, on VBOX is where we're at. Writing a Minecraft plugin in Clojure is a bit complicated. <laughs> My break function. You broke a string, Lamau. I don't know how people use software configured in Lua. And just like that, I avoided 3,000 lines of boilerplate. <laughs> Lamau. It includes an 800-line JavaScript file that generates Minecraft command handler code. 
Oh my. <laughs> that's after Kling formatting it, of course. Lamau. That's terrifying. But yeah, we've done it. We're, if you couldn't tell, getting to the end of the stream. There's not much really to do now, other than, uh, you know, nothing. There's not much to do now. That's all there is to it. Won't change it yet. Won't change it yet. Does anybody have any questions? We built an OS from scratch today on stream. Completely. We had some people join the Discord. That was good. I'm very happy about that. Alexi, thank you. And uh, yeah, we just had a ton of fun. We had so much fun. <laughs> I love JavaScript. Mr. Mugame, no. No. Or, or... <laughs> Oh no, is that true? Oh no, what is that? Oh my. That's scary. <laughs> but yeah, in a in a short four and a half hours, we were able to build and run our OS, answer some questions about it, and uh, just have fun overall. We had <laughs> we downloaded CMake for Linux. How about that? How about that? That was impressive. And, uh, yeah, that won't close. That's not good. There we go. Goddamn Windows sucks. <laughs> close this. We're closing it all, baby. But, yeah, that's it. That's all I got for the stream. A evaluates to B if A is null or undefined in A otherwise. Null-ish. Hmm. <laughs> just like falsy <laughs> yeah it's falsy it's kind of false oh yeah let's let's go over that all right last thing i want to point out that i actually created the program uh that is needed to create GPT good partition tables. You can use fdisk as well on Linux, but on Windows, you can't use fdisk. So I created this, uh, this program, which creates disk images with valid good partition tables cross-platform. How about that? You can uh, add a partition using the following flag, which is just part, path, and type, which is a GUID or a preset which is either one of these or etc. And uh, effectively, what this means is that Sir Aid says you can't use FDisk on Windows. Honestly, that's not a bad thing, Lamau. You're right, you're right. I mean, I like FDisk, but still. <laughs> FDisk is really nice. It's pretty, it's pretty nice. Uh, put the values in mixed ending in canonical fashion, if you don't know. GUIDs have an order. And uh, yeah, basically, you just build it with CMake with any C compiler, and uh, you just you just use it. It's pretty simple. It's it's not complicated. Accept partition name as argument. Ooh, that's a good idea. But that's a string conversion nightmare. I see why I didn't do it. Uh, hashtag define underscore CRT secure no warnings. Lamau. Screw you, MSVC. Is what that says. But yeah. We then basically just say, uh, oh yeah, very nice. We get our image, we set our sector size. Again, these should be const expert, but it's a C file, so it shouldn't, it doesn't matter. And yeah, we basically just go through each one, write the file into the output file, and uh, there's that. Sorry, it's just, oh yes, the shut up, I'm not going to use fopens warning. <laughs> yep. <laughs> you know what's funny? Even though this is here, it still warns me. It says put this in there and it won't do it. <laughs> it still warns me when it's defined. It's like, ah, there's no winning. But yeah, there we are. There we are. This, uh, this is the program I used to make a bootable GPT version of the fat file system that stores the kernel executable and user space executables and fonts and stuff like that. Pretty cool. I think it's pretty cool. 
not too bad. It's not too bad, at least. I felt proud of it. <laughs> uh, but yeah, that's kind of all I got. Null coalescing, that's what it is. I, I, <laughs> I remember null coalescing from C Sharp. Anyway, that's it. That's us done. I got nothing. If you have any uh, questions, pop pop them at me in the Discord. I'm about to leave Twitch. Uh, but yeah, check out the Discord. Be sure to join. It's a ton of fun. It's in the links down below in the About section. You can get announcements every time we go live and just join this awesome, awesome, awesome community of people. Mr. Mugame said, It's cursed! I open the stream. Stream is at its end. <laughs> It's cursed, Lamau. Every time. Here, just for you. <laughs> oh no. I'm so sorry. Why does it have to bug? The one time. The one time it matters. It has to bug out. Fuck, man. There we go. I'm loving it. <laughs> oh, I love that it just bugs out the first time. Just boop, 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 boop. <laughs> Not the music at all. Mr. Mugame says PC speaker. You are correct. PC speaker. <laughs> in ROS. In case you can't tell. That's what we have open. This is Lenser OS, and it is better than Windows, and I am God, and this is his next temple. <laughs> How about that, hmm? Any who disagree? <laughs> uh, Mr. Mugame says, oh God, <laughs> no. Mal. Yes. I wonder if I'll ever get white if I right-click enough. <laughs> I'm spending way too much time on this, but it is fun. It is fun to just draw with this weird, weird <laughs> ability of random colors and dotted lines. <laughs> Sir Aid says, oh dear. <laughs> Lamau, it's here. Yes, <laughs> it is here. <laughs> this is an evil one. I'm so goddamn immature. <laughs> I'm a child. I'm drawing. I'm drawing and finding it enjoyable. Just sitting here, drawing a face that looks like crap. It's not even good art. <laughs> right? <laughs> it's not. It sucks, but I enjoy it. Grr. Ah. <laughs> I'm so stupid. Can you believe I'm putting this on the internet for people to see? <laughs> By the way, for non-dotted lines, maybe you can just remember the position the mouse was at and fill the pixels between that position and the current position. Yeah, just. <laughs> yeah, you know, just fill the pixels between the position. Easy. <laughs> Mr. Mugame says, sounds like math. Yeah, I don't know how to do that shit. We'd have to like calculate the rise over run and then it would be wrong all the time. I think it would look even worse, personally. I think the dotted lines make it look uh, fancy. That's what I'm going to go with. Fancy. <laughs> Grr. <laughs> Such a stupid thing. Ugh. Sir Aid says, don't ask me how to do it. I suck at graphic stuff. <laughs> Ugh. That makes me happy because like... The code to draw a rectangle made me so confused. <laughs> oh. 
We're going to go giving them teeth in the lazy way. Rainbow teeth. I'm having too much fun, <laughs> just doing nothing. <laughs> Which may describe all of today, honestly. Sorry, it says, I didn't even like art class in school. I hated art class, it was dumb. Everyone just sits there and does nothing. Like it. <laughs> the eyes are not e <laughs> even. <laughs> They're one off. <laughs> I screwed up. <laughs> oh. There we go. That's better. <laughs> oh. So it says. I didn't, uh, I'd rather spend my time implementing over-engineered vectorized algorithms than deal with rendering stuff. Speaking of which, I'm going to look at all the memcopy code and see what I can do. Bless. Mr. Mugame says, does it have a libc? It does. It does indeed have a libc. Uh, it's in user libc. Here's all the libc. For example, here's unistida. There you go. We have sys sys calls. Let's you make sys calls. Why do we return a uint pointer t? <laughs> what? <laughs> I don't get this at all. I don't know why we return that. That seems insane. It's probably a convention. It's probably a convention. But yeah, we have we have a libc with all this stuffs. It's a mini libc, but it is a libc. As you can see, time.h is a uh, full of things, full of things. <laughs> no, there's a lot to still implement, but it's honestly not too bad. There's more than you would think. We could definitely set these up better. Sarade says, uint pointer t is normally just the generic return type for pointer or integer. All right, then that's fine. Syscalls can, ref syscall can return that. But yeah, uh, we did it. I'm pretty sure we've done all of it. <laughs> all of it that's possible. Sarade says, IO file time. <laughs> I didn't even think of that. Yeah, I know. <laughs> There's so much to do. There's so much to do. And uh, it'll never end. So yeah, if you'd like to help out, we are accepting pull requests. We merged one at the beginning of today's stream, in fact. So don't feel uh, don't feel like you can't, can't get there. You definitely can. I'm pretty sure it just uh, made the scripts executable on Linux, right? Yep. By Sir Aid. Shall sell Sir Aid, baby. But yeah, that's it. That's it. Check out the codeberg or the GitHub down below. Mr. Mugame says, I can fix a typo in some readme if you want. Honestly, there's so much documentation that goes with the OS. As far as build instructions, it'd be great. <laughs> that doesn't, I just, it doesn't seem right. It's just slightly too slow. I feel like Ah, oh, you know what it is. You know what it is. I bet you every time we read it, we have to lock it and stop it from counting. That's definitely what it is. Otherwise, we'd read bits from multiple numbers. Because we can't do an atomic four-byte read. Ah, uh, I mean, we can, but we can't. <laughs> from the IO bus. Uh, okay. So yeah, basically, in the HPET, I'm sure what's happening... 
Yeah, see, so when we get the HPET number, we stop the main counter and then restart it. Start raid says torn reads rip. <laughs> I don't know what that means. Uh, but yeah, so when we're stopping and starting the counter, we should probably, like, not. <laughs> oh, I'm such a dummy. God. So this is hardware, hardware register. Like, we're just reading. I see, but it can have large counter support, and we can't read 8 bytes. I mean, we can. We just need to make sure this is an atomic read, then we don't have to worry about locking and unlocking. Also, remember when I said, talked about there's deadlocks? Welcome to deadlocks. Uh, deadlock city, actually. Because <laughs> stop main counter creates a locker that never explicitly unlocks, which is interesting. I'm sure it's just in the destructor. Sarade so says, a torn read is when you read a value while someone's writing to it, and you end up with some of the bits of the old value and some of the bits of the new value. Yeah, that's exactly. Okay. Yeah, a torn read. I see. I it, It's making sense now. Uh, that does make sense now. Yeah, that's what this handles. That way, we say, uh, keep reading the low bytes until the high bytes match. Uh the last time. So if the low bytes are read and the high bytes are read again and they're the same as the original high, then it, chances are it didn't change, right? Chances are that it did not change. So then we say, okay, we can just break and set result. But if these are different, then that means it's changing still. And again, you could argue that if we stop the main counter, we don't actually need to have this torn read situation. But, uh, are we, I'm just curious. This is a horrible idea. What if we just don't, you know? What if we just didn't, is what I'm curious about. I love this, by the way. I love this little drawing I did. <laughs> uh... Rebuild the kernel. Thanks, boss. All right, and reboot. Give it to me. Whoa. <laughs> I may have broken things. Nope, we're good. Hey, it worked. <laughs> Ah, yes, the classic. It works great. It works fantastic. <laughs> oh well. We're not here to fix the HPET today. Lamau. <laughs> I don't even know how that works. I don't know how that works, dog. It really doesn't make sense. <laughs> when we initialize it, nothing is different. Whatever. Whatever. We won't change it. Serraid says, at least it's no longer no longer off by like four, lol. True, true, it's off by infinite. Uh but yeah, the, the reason it's off is because over time stopping and starting it means that we lose track of real time. So what we should really do is like during this time that the timer is stopped. <laughs> We'd have to keep track of how much time goes by, how long this took, with another timer, <laughs> and then add it back to this timer by setting the main counter to something plus itself, which also has to stop and start the main counter. Oh no, it's a horrible mess. It's a deadlock mess in this, <laughs> in this, in this code. Don't even, don't even worry about it. <laughs> 
our OS works. That's all I got. We're at the end of the stream. Ah, uh, yes, use a timer to time the timer to tell the timer how much time passed while timing the timer. <laughs> I'm loving it. Sir Aid gets it. <laughs> Sir Aid says, at that point, just yeet it and use the timer you were going to use to time the timer. <laughs> it's true. Oh, it's so true. But if we didn't call hpet get, it wouldn't be wrong. But if we didn't call hpet get, we wouldn't know what it is. It's like the classic, like, particle. Like, you can see where it is, but it won't be there anymore. <laughs> it's now somewhere else. <laughs> Fuck me. Whatever. It works. That's all I'm happy about. We have user space processes that can write to standard out. It's fucking dope. We got an OS. It's a hobby OS, but it's an OS. And, uh, yeah. I'm happy with it. Oh, that looks funky. Sorry, this timer is accurate. <laughs> is that what it said in HBET? It's probably what it said in HBET, I would bet. Because it's supposed to be the most accurate timer. Sorry, it says, so long as you don't try to use it, that is. <laughs> Exactly. HPET can count super accurately. You just can't tell what the counter is at unless you make it inaccurate. <laughs> so funny. <clears throat> Mr. Mugame, sounds like quantum physics. <laughs> oh, thank you all so much for watching. I had a great time today. I laughed. I cried. I pissed. I shit. No, I didn't. I don't know why that came to my brain, but it did. Uh, I'm not like that normally, I swear. Uh, but we laughed, we cried, we did a lot. Be sure to check out the Discord, join us. <laughs> Mr. Mugame says, what? <laughs> Don't worry about it, mate. Uh, it's just a joke gone wrong. I could tell us as I was saying it. It was like, this is a bad idea. You shouldn't do this. <laughs> it was just uh, funny how casual it was. <laughs> gonna die laughing I'm just the, the stream's gonna end with wheeze <laughs> fuck me okay anyway let me do my little spiel i've been streaming like five hours that's a long time so i would greatly appreciate it if you would donate that way i can afford arthritis medication for when i'm older <laughs> i'm gonna need it if i sit down for this long in a row no, but seriously, I am going to need it. So uh, be sure to check out that donate button down below. If you leave a donation, I will read your message on stream. And if you leave your username, I'll attribute it to you and say thank you, thank you, thank you. Shout out to our most recent contributor, RPWH or underscore RPWH or Rory or whatever you want to call them. They're the best. They donated 10 bucks and they said thanks for the stream, Mister. They're awesome. Thank you so much, Rory. And uh, Thanks for being so active in the community as well, RPWH. You're very active, and it's a ton of fun. Along with all of you, if you don't, uh, if you wouldn't like to give money, or if you can't give money, that's fine. Don't worry about it. Just check out the Discord, come say hi, and just be a friend. That's way more valuable than ten bucks. Thank you, and goodbye. No, thank you all so much for watching. I really appreciate it. Check out the YouTube down below in the links. Check out everything. Check out check out everything that's down there. Codebird, GitHub, Star, follow, watch, do the things, and uh, make me proud. I love all of you. Thank you for coming. I'll see you next time. And uh, this is going to be it for now. See you till next time. I don't even know what we're going to do next time. Maybe compiler dev? Maybe, maybe C-Note? Maybe Light? We'll work on the text editor? Who knows? Who knows? Mr. Mugame says, I'm going to DDoS you if you don't end it next.